Hi everyone, uh, we're delighted to welcome to you to the um, LSHGM Symposium on Statistical and Mathematical Models and how they can combine with big data to improve our response to pandemics. This uh, organisation of this symposium has been very much a joint enterprise on behalf of the Centre for Statistical Methodology, uh, the Centre for Mathematical Modelling of Infectious Diseases, our newest centre, the Epidemic, uh, Epidemic Preparedness and Response Centre, and the Electronic Health Records Group, all based at London School of High. So we split this symposium into a couple of sessions. Uh, in the first session, um, researchers are going to be discussing the statistical and mathematical modelling issues, the data issues that they've encountered in their research, which is aimed to inform policy. And so we're going to have four talks. And during these talks, if questions occur to you, uh, then do please use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom and post your questions as soon as they arise to you. And then our chairs are going to collate those questions and put them to our speakers, either at the end of their session or at the uh, panel discussion uh, just there. And then we're going to take a little break between 5 and 5.30. Um, I'd suggest that you stay logged into Zoom and then you'll be all primed for our second session, uh, which is on preparing for the next pandemic. And we're very lucky uh, to have some very senior policy advisors join us for this. And they're going to each give short talks to provoke some areas for discussion and debate. And so the session today is going to culminate in a panel discussion involving them. And again, hopefully drawing on your, your questions. And that's going to be convened by my colleagues, uh, Sinead and Liam. And we're going to finish uh, by seven o'clock. So... Um, that's pretty much all as by way of intro. I just wanted to also flag a couple of uh, big uh, virtual events that we've got coming up at LSHGM. Uh, firstly, on the 28th of February, our new centre is going to be launching and they're going to be drawing together again some high profile speakers, including the Director General of WHO. So do please uh, join us for that. And our Centre for Statistical Methodology is running a series of spring seminars on some of the stats issues that have been raised during the COVID-19 pandemic. And again, uh, do feel free to come and join us for that. These events are all going to be mentioned on our uh, events website. And that's also the place to go uh, to download a recording of today's session. Uh, so do please uh, stay in touch with all of our centres and our activities in this space. So I'm going to stop sharing there now, and I'm going to hand you over to our two uh, chairs for session one, uh, to Adam and to Martin, who are going to introduce our speakers and also handle your questions and answers. So hope you very much enjoy today, and uh, thanks again for joining us. Adam, it's over to you. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, as I mentioned, Mark and I will be, be chairing this session, and if you've got questions in the talk, to put them in. Um, we'll have some time for kind of specific points after the talk and then a broader panel discussion. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker, who's uh, Professor Elizabeth Williamson uh, from the London School, who's going to be talking about extracting insights from uh, clinical data. So over to you, Fizz. Right, so my name is Elizabeth Williamson, and I'm a biostatistician here at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I'm going to be talking about my experiences with open safety. I want to start by acknowledging the patients whose data has been used in this work and the many other people involved in the collaboration. Open Safety is a new collaboration initiated in response to the COVID pandemic. And we're working on behalf of NHS England. And it's a collaboration between the Oxford uh, Data Lab and the Electronic Health Record Group here at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Now, Open Safety is a secure analytics platform for NHS electronic health records. And Open Safely is built on the, the ideas and principles of transparency and open science, and above all, respecting patient confidentiality. And one of the really important facets of how Open Safely works is that the researchers don't need to access that underlying disclosive data. So what data is available in the Open Safely platform? Well, it's now expanded from this, but in the early days, we had primary care electronic health record data from TPP for around 24 million people. And that data was linked to lab test results, to emergency care, death certificate data, and intensive care data. And I understand this is more than 60 billion rows of data. So there's huge amounts of information here. 
The first thing we did with these data was just to map out who's dying from COVID. So this first analysis included 17 million patients, about 11,000 of whom died from COVID-19. And I wanted to draw your attention to the date on the right hand side. So we managed to post this to MedArchive on the 7th of May 2020. And if you remember, the first lockdown in the UK was, I think, end of March. So this was 42 days from the collaboration starting and, and this first analysis. And that really does illustrate the timeliness with which we can use these data for research. So I wanted to highlight three main groups of question we've been able to address using these data. So the first set of questions relate to who's at highest risk from severe consequences of COVID. And as well as that additional descriptive work, we then were able to look at specific patient groups. So one of the first ones we looked at were people with learning disabilities. And we explored risks of COVID-19 hospital admission and death for people with learning disability, finding really greatly inflated risks. And shortly thereafter, um, people with learning disability were added to the prioritization for vaccines. The second group of questions, which were obviously of great interest, particularly early in the pandemic, relate to whether existing treatments could help protect against infection or severe consequences of infection. And we were able to use these data to explore lots of potential candidates, including inhaled corticosteroids, NSAIDs, and hydroxychloroquine. And more recently, obviously, we've been thinking a lot about vaccination. These data lend themselves really well to thinking about what's going on, describing what's happening. And this paper describes who's getting vaccinated. We've also looked at effectiveness of vaccines. So here we have a graph from a comparative effectiveness paper comparing the CHADOX in blue with the Pfizer vaccine in red. And these data are so large that we're able to look at rarer outcomes such as hospitalisation and death, which, of course, the original vaccine trials weren't powered to explore. So I've talked about a few of the things that we can do with these data, but obviously there are challenges. And these challenges arise largely because these data are assembled from distinct sources. And those sources are collected for specific purposes, typically not for research. So the, the base of the primary care data, for instance, is collected for clinical care. When you go to your GP and you perhaps say, I had an asthma attack, that information goes in your record, but that wouldn't have been there had you not had a health issue. So it leads to this phenomenon called data dependent sampling. And if we don't take account of the way in which the data arise, we can end up with some quite severe systematic biases. So broadly speaking, to bring these data together to address policy questions of interest, we need to make some assumptions, whether we make those implicitly or explicitly. So it's important that we frame them excessively and transparently, and then use appropriate models to answer the questions. I'm going to spend the rest of my talk focusing on this issue of estimating the risk of COVID-19 related deaths, because it illustrates some of the key challenges. So I'm going to start at the end of the process of looking at who's at highest risk, implementing a policy. Now, statistical models are really good at providing risk estimates or risk equations like the one shown here. So equations that take a large number of clinical characteristics and put them together in sometimes quite a complex mathematical formula and spit out a, an estimated risk. On the other hand, Policy is often implemented in terms of a small number of patient groups or characteristics. And there's sometimes a bit of a disconnect between the two. And it's not always clear how those risk prediction models should map to those um, policy implementations. So I think a bit more communication about uh, how, how the estimation feeds into the implementation would be helpful. Now, it can be argued that the the quantity of policy relevance is what's my probability of dying from COVID given I'm infected, so once I'm infected. However, particularly in the early days of pandemic, before there was widespread testing, it simply wasn't possible to identify in our data who was infected and who wasn't. 
So there was no represent, representative population that we could explore that in. So the thing that we can estimate very easily is what's the probability of dying from COVID in the general population? This, however, brings its own problems because that question combines the process of exposure, infection, and dying once infected. So now, as well as predictors of the death part, we also need to think about the process of the predictors of that process of exposure and infection. So in these data, we've got quite good information about comorbidities, and we've got an amount of data about patient demographics. If we start thinking about the key drivers of exposure, however, there's limited data. So one of the key determinants of exposure is likely to be occupation, and we have very limited occupation data in electronic health records. Patient behaviour is absolutely crucial. So there are probably patient groups who have been shielding very strictly, in other words, avoiding contact with others right from the start of the pandemic. And in our data, they would look like a very low risk patient group, but that's simply reflective of a behavior that's not present in our data. The biggest driver of um, exposure, obviously, is the local level of circulating infection. And while we don't have direct measures of that in our data, we do have proxy measures. So we have things like, what's the amount of um, suspected COVID cases in the local general practices? Now, we're often told that for policy, absolute risks are the thing that we're interested in, and they're much easier to communicate with people. However, in a pandemic situation, obviously the, the risk of dying from COVID-19 is very variable over time. So on the top right here, we have the John Hopkins data of COVID-19 mortality in the UK from the start of the pandemic to the present day. And clearly, my risk of dying from COVID depends very much on which part of the pandemic I'm thinking about. If we want to provide accurate absolute risk estimates, we need to explicitly model the relationship between the outcome and the changing levels of circulating infection. Now, a classic statistical approach to try and look at who's at higher risk is a Cox model, which accounts for that changing baseline level, but it doesn't explicitly model it. And that doesn't allow us to provide transferable uh, absolute risk estimates for different parts of the pandemic. OK, so if we want these accurate risk estimates, we need to explicitly model that relationship. But that requires us to have precise measures of circulating infection. As I mentioned, we have some proxies available within electronic health records, but sadly, those don't give us sufficiently accurate estimates. So we can obtain these absolute risk estimates from within these data, but we do need to import external estimates of that level of circulating infection. So broadly speaking, these big electronic health record data provide a unique resource that do offer the possibility of providing time updating estimates of absolute risk of severe outcomes from COVID or indeed other outcomes, be they infectious or not infectious, in the, the general population. And they do this in a very timely manner using the power of modern computing. And very importantly, they can also do this while respecting patient confidentiality through uh, not requiring researchers to see or access that underlying dystosive data. So broadly speaking, these data are analyzable almost in real time and they're hugely powerful allowing us to explore rare outcomes and small clinical groups. Some of the limitations I've touched on could be improved by additional elements and linkages, which could bring in data on things like occupation and better ethnicity data. And in the event of a new pandemic, I think early communication with cohorts set up to monitor infection levels would be crucial to allow us to do things like identify infected populations and get good measures of circulating infection to help with these data. Overall, communication with policymakers is absolutely crucial to enable analysts to match their analyses to policy aims in order to provide informed advice in a timely manner based on well understood models and clear assumptions. Okay, thank you. Um, so one question that's come in is around um, uh, other opportunities to link uh, genomic test data with patient data. So I suppose that could be interpreted as linking the kind of COVID test data, but I I mean, personally, I'd also be interested around 
are there kind of other genomic information that could be linked in terms of the covariates? Yeah, I mean, in principle, anything could be linked, really. But because it's such a big data resource and it's um, managed by NHS England, it all has. There's a lot of sort of information governance steps, and link, new linkages do take a lot of time to establish. So yes, uh, probably it's very possible, but whether that can be done in a timely manner remains to be seen. So if you're interested, I would suggest you go to the Open Safety website where there's a mechanism for requesting linkages. Yeah, thanks. Um, and uh, to just, I had a quick question as well, just on something you mentioned about the kind of problems with proxy for circulating infection. Um, in looking at this, you mentioned they weren't accurate. Were there any kind of systematic biases you found? Well, the problem is that the sort of proxies available are things like um, COVID, COVID attendances at A&E or COVID hospitalizations, which is a bit too close to the final outcome you're looking at, or suspected case rates in GP. And actually, suspected case rates did quite well. But when the infection is very low, I think it's just a very sparse event. Um, so, you know, it's very hard to distinguish nothing from very little. So yeah, I, um, actually just one, one more question has come in, which I guess is, is specific to this. Um, so it's, is the data available for, for free for all the scientific community? So it might be good to provide a bit more context about how that works. Um, yes, I think I'll probably best refer you to the Open Safety website. Um, it, it is free. Um, it's obviously no one can see the data. So there's a process. And even once you've got um, the ability to run analyses, you don't get to see the data. So you can't ever have the data, per se. But yeah, there's a process for anyone to apply on the website. Yeah, and it, I, I looked at it recently. There's some great case studies on there as well, so I encourage everyone to visit. Um, one more question that's come in, um, just again, about the kind of external data validation. So asking about um, things like the ONS community survey, to what extent those can be representative of, um, of what's going on in terms of local infection risk? Yes, um, I haven't actually explored doing that, but some of my colleagues are working on that data. So I think that's something we'll look at soon and and hopefully have better plans in place for next time. Um, I suppose it, it possibly always, always comes back to linkage that obviously those data are, are very securely managed. So there's probably a kind of aggregation thing going on um, as well. Um, so I think those are the questions we had coming in specifically, but I'm sure a lot of the topics that you've raised will kind of... Um, a crop up in other talks and hopefully we can follow up in uh, the panel discussion. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Martin uh, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much, um, Adam, and thanks for the uh, previous speaker. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Natalie Dean, who is an assistant professor of biostatistics and bioinformatics from Emory University in the US. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to your talk, which is on modeling and big data for evaluating vaccines during pandemic. So over to you, Natalie, please, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Let me just get my slides up. No problem. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I'm so pleased to be here with this really um, wonderful group uh, to, to talk about this topic of using modeling and big data. Um, and so the overarching question here for this symposium is how can mathematical and statistical models combine with big data to improve our response to pandemics? And I was specifically asked to think about uh, applying these um, models to evaluating the efficacy and effectiveness of vaccines. And so as we think about these types of applications, of course, we're in the midst of a COVID pandemic, and so that is on the forefront of our minds. And there are still many open questions about evaluating COVID vaccines. Although we have efficacious vaccines already, in the future we'll be thinking about different types of vaccines, maybe intranasal vaccines, um, very specific products like an Omicron-specific booster, and uh, something like a pan sarbacovirus vaccine, something to elicit broader immunity. Um, but at the same time, I also want to talk about other diseases that we've been thinking about for a while um, that have the potential to cause public health emergencies and for which we lack adequate medical countermeasures. And so this includes a number of different pathogens, um, including disease X, uh, 
So some as yet unidentified pathogen, which is really what um, SARS-CoV-2 was to us um, in, in 2020. And so, um, and so in this talk, in this talk, I'm going to think a little bit about our describe a little bit about the ways that we can use mathematical and statistical models to plan um, randomized vaccine trials. We'll talk a little bit about observational studies at the end, but I want to spend most of my time talking about randomized trials. And I'm not just going to talk about COVID. I also want to talk about some other pathogens and really just give a sort of a high level summary of some of the ways that models have been applied and ways we can think about them for the future. So the first question I'm going to talk about is how we can use mathematical and statistical models to plan vaccine trials. And one way is to use them to prioritize trial sites. So um, here's an example from the Zika epidemic. And we can think about using these projection models um, in order to identify areas that are most likely to experience transmission in the future. And we know that in order for a vaccine trial to be able to demonstrate efficacy, it needs to be placed in a location where there's active transmission. And not all areas are going to be similarly suited for that. So one use of models is to look forward and see during the trial period how much transmission is expected based on previous trends, based on uh, known location-specific risk factors. So for Zika, maybe how much dengue has there been? How, what is the abundance of the mosquito vector in that area? And so in this example, um, there were independent groups that used their own models, their own modeling methodology, but combined together to create this kind of consensus, this ranking um, based on the individual strengths of each of these models. So this is one application of models for, for planning trials. Um, but in addition to giving us information about the, the median or the mean attack rate in the future, uh, models are particularly valuable because they allow us to characterize uncertainty. So it's not just the, that median, it's also a whole distribution of possible outcomes. And I think one of the defining features of emerging infectious diseases is that there's a lot of uncertainty in whether transmission will really take off in a particular location. You can think about this as being very bimodal. You have um, a chance that there's gonna be a large outbreak, but also some real probability that there's no transmission at all in a particular location. And that's very important information when we're thinking about planning a trial. And so, um, and so one way we can use sort of the full suite of model projections is to think about planning um, how many sites need to be participating in a trial to really mitigate that risk of no transmission um, occurring and being really underpowered. And sort of this is an application of using some Zika data just to demonstrate the, the principles. And we can, you know, in the extreme, if you have one site, you know, there's some chance that you have a very large outbreak, but also a large mass near zero, which reflects um, no transmission there. As you enroll more and more sites, you're including in more lower risk areas, um, but you're and, and you're you have a lower chance that transmission will simultaneously take off in all of these locations at once. But you're also decreasing this mass near zero, which is really the major issue uh, of being underpowered in your study. So this is another type of application of models is really to get at that uncertainty. Um, and to characterize that and include that in the planning process. Um, another application is to uh, monitor a trial in progress. And this is from the folks at London School back during the um, Ebola epidemic in West Africa. And so when you're in the context of a declining epidemic, so say you already have a trial in progress, but the epidemiology has changed and um, the outbreak is now waning, um, so uh, how do you make decisions about what you should do in the future with the trial? What is the likelihood of success of that trial? We can use models here. And so, um, and so in this application, they're looking at, okay, based on in the context of a declining epidemic, when you start the trial um, and projecting forward using a Bayesian modeling framework. Um, and you can see though that the later you start the trial, 
the less likely that trial is to be successful because there's an important probability that the epidemic will end. And so um, another way to use models is to really to, um, to monitor the progress of a trial, including the probability that transmission ends and the trial will no longer be able to accrue data and may prompt a change in decisions like the need to add more sites or increase the pace of accrual. Um, another application of these models that I think is really interesting is to um, assess the feasibility of, of a trial. And all of the pathogens that we're thinking about with these emerging infectious diseases have very different epidemiology. One example is NIPA, uh, which causes, which spills over from the animal reservoir and causes these small but highly fatal outbreaks. Um, and so using existing epidemiological studies, using epidemiological research on the, you know, the, the um, frequency of these spillovers and the size of these outbreaks in Bangladesh, um, this group was able to uh, looked at the feasibility of a randomized trial um, for against a NIPA vaccine. You can bring in logistical constraints about how quickly you can accrue uh, or enroll people into a trial um, and based on different assumptions about how the vaccine is working. And you can start to explore, you know, how large will the trial need to be given that this is a pretty infrequent event and, and or how long will the trial need to last given that it's an infrequent event. And you can really start to explore the um, space of, of feasibility for these trials. And where this becomes, um, where this starts to look not feasible, I mean, of course, these, uh, for, the, for the trial designs that they explore here, they will require either extremely large trial or extremely long trial. And this triggers, um, the models help inform another set of discussions, which is what is the evidentiary pathway that needs to be used in order to uh, approve that particular vaccine. And so we're very familiar with this pathway that goes through field efficacy trials, so our phase three trials. Um, and of course, this is the, the gold standard and, uh, and, and, sh and should always be the default. Um, but the FDA and other regulatory agencies have expressed some willingness to discuss alternative pathways in settings where it's really not feasible um, to, to conduct a field efficacy trial. So these sort of other alternative pathways um, are being discussed in the context where, you know, where you can demonstrate the um, impossibility or just the extreme challenges of conducting the, the more classical ideal, um, ideal approach. So in that case, models really contribute a lot to the discussion and thinking about what is the best way forward for a particular pathogen. So um, I just wanna wrap up with a few thoughts. And the first, just regarding randomized trials, of course, we all know models are not crystal balls and they're not gonna be able to perfectly project the future. There are always curveballs, unpredicted things that happen um, in these epidemics. And uh, they rely very heavily on high quality input data. So when we think about investments in the future, um, increasing surveillance, uh, strengths of surveillance is always going to be one of the most important features, really making sure that we have that uh, surveillance data, particularly in resource limited settings and areas where these um, outbreaks are, are most likely to occur that um, can really contribute to, to these models. But at the end of the day, there's always gonna be some degree of uncertainty. And so one of the big um, key messages we keep coming back to when we think about uh, trials for these emerging pathogens is where possible building flexibility directly into the trials so that the protocols can change and adapt as the situation evolves. Um, and along with that, thinking about these large core protocol trials, so trials that have a lot of different locations that really um, are mitigating that risk, right? So that if, if an outbreak uh, does not um, continue, wanes in one particular area, you've got another area where 
um, where you can pick things up and continue to accrue and continue to gather that evidence. Um, I just also wanted to have some parting thoughts about observational studies, although very briefly, but just that large healthcare databases have clearly proven their worth for evaluating COVID vaccine effectiveness and show a lot of promise for, um, for, for the future and having a system in place to evaluate the effectiveness of, of vaccines. Um, yet, you know, we know that they're subject to a lot of issues like uh, very complex confounding, selection bias, data quality as we think about merging these large data, um, databases. And so I think a very interesting area for research in the future is generating these kind of hybrid designs that leverage the strength and size of these large healthcare databases, but enhance them with uh, built-in ways to verify the data using validation sets, so um, using additional sampling uh, to additional testing, um, and also building in these bias indicators, these sort of checks, these ways um, to, to increase our confidence in the results. And my last thought is just that a reminder that not everything is gonna be like COVID. And, um, and of course, the set of challenges that the enormous challenges we face with COVID uh, are not going to necessarily carry over to other emerging pathogens. And for particularly for vaccines, one thing I think about is just the ubiquity of COVID. It's everywhere with very high incidence rates. And that, of course, presents it, you know, enormous uh, challenges and it increases the importance. But, um, but it also made conducting randomized trials pretty straightforward. Um, just in terms of accruing, uh, accruing efficacy data. And actually, it was in some cases, it was accruing the safety data that was the rate limiting step. This is different. This is going to be different for other emerging pathogens. And I think about, for example, Ebola and just how um, spatial temporally focused um, other emerging pathogens can be uh, and not as diffuse. And just to keep that in mind um, as we move forward. So thank you so much for listening. I'm really uh, pleased and look forward to, to questions and learning more from the group. Thank you so much, um, Natalie, for your really nice uh, presentation. Um, just uh, um, I'm, uh, please, if you have any questions, if you put it on the chat, I'll, I'll read it out. But the first question I have is that um, in, in communities in uh, low and middle income countries, such as Africa, where you get frequent outbreak, we tend to get very low quality data. So I'm wondering how, uh, if you have any thoughts about how you could model a situation in community where uh, we may need to assess and the data is has, 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 has very low quality. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an, um, a major challenge. Is, you know, we think about planning these types of, of trials and. And so one thing that folks have been thinking about, say, for like loss of fever, is how we can use inter-epidemic periods or, um, you know, sort of low times to increase our understanding of the epidemiology. So go in and conduct additional studies like seroprevalence surveys and try to, um, where possible, strengthen surveillance systems and just strengthen our understanding of, of the epidemiology. But it's a big task to, to figure out, you know, to, to strengthen these surveillance systems. But if we're going to be able to use models um, that are really sort of location specific and, and um, detailed enough, they'll need that addi those additional data streams. Right. I mean, in, in the normal circumstances, well, not normal, but uh, WHO tend to use estimated data uh, 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 to do part of the ammonia bottling or to predict what may have happened. And I just wondered if that's ever been considered in your view? Estimated data? Yeah. Of um, uh, what? Other person. So for example, COVID is an example. A, a, a lot of the uh, policies that are driven in a lot of African countries tend to use data from high income countries, actually. So our, uh, we don't really collect our own data on site. And I just wondered if you could comment on that. While, while I'm speaking, I'm still looking at the chat. <laughs> and then uh, there's only one question which I'll realize in a second, sorry. Yeah, yeah, well, I guess it'll depend on the particular pathogen, right? And, and where it circulates um, and, and so how much you need to, to generalize it, where something is sort of confined to a particular region um, that, that you wouldn't need to make as much of a leap in terms of generalizability. 
Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, we've seen different dynamics play out in different countries throughout the, the COVID pandemic and different things happening like in South Africa than, than happening um, in Europe or in the US. And, um, and, and so, right, just recognizing that should be very, very cautious about uh, extrapolating from, from one region to another and, and really strengthens the need for having that directly observed surveillance data that's, that's local. Okay. All right, so thanks so much. Uh, the, the question about whether you can introduce new vaccine using cluster or step way approach. Um, uh, could you answer that quickly and then we'll pass it on to Adam, please. Yeah, yeah. So step wedge has been discussed a lot as a as a type of uh, trial that where you have these phased introductions that may be more ethical in the sense that there is this sort of gradual rollout and that everyone ultimately gets a vaccine. Just has a lot of challenges. There's just it's just really challenging because there are these very striking background temporal trends that happen with emerging infectious diseases. And so whatever method you use just needs to um, to to be able to to handle that. And, you know, and in the end, it, right, just discussing whether that really is a better approach than, than being able to kind of quickly get an answer um, with, uh, with a more traditional trial. Step one trials are also very inflexible. You kind of need to set the whole design from the beginning, which is, I think, really challenging when you need that flexibility in, in the context of a pandemic. All right. So thank you so much Natalie, for, for the talk and also for the talks. And uh, I'll pass it on to Adam. We can take further questions during the panel discussion. So Adam, over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. As Martin says, please keep the cash questions coming and we'll hope we get to broader things uh, at the end. So the next speaker is Dr. Mark Bagelan from uh, Imperial College London. Um, so over to you, Mark. Sorry, Mark, your microphone is muted. Okay, sorry uh, for the thing was unmuted. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Mark Bagla. I'm uh, been leading the Imperial Real Time Modeling Team, um, and I'm going to um, so first, uh, what what is real time modeling? Uh, so uh, this is a picture from from uh, actually the uh, flu uh, pandemic in in the UK. In, 2009, uh, so not not something new, real time modeling, and I think it was quite interesting that today is actually ground, ground hog, uh, Groundhog Day. But um, so, mathematical model uh, is a model that has been updated or fitted or calibrated to an ongoing epidemic or pandemic. Uh, it should reflect what we know about the current epidemic. Uh, it might be it might include some uh, knowledge from from previous experience, especially if you uh, use uh, the Bayesian prodding, you you can include prior information and combine it with uh, your, your data. Uh, it, use, I mean, it should use a formal statistical fitting and analysis and, epi and epidemic uh, modeling. Uh, if done properly, uh, then it should give relevant projections about a future course of epidemic. And I stress the word projections here. I mean, there's also all uh, connection with forecast, but um, I, I, I will touch on this uh, in the next slide. Uh, and some models can look at alternative scenario of transmission, which uh, we call counterfactuals, and this can uh, inform policy making. So really models, uh, real-time model is really a bridge between data to uh, um, uh, feeding to uh, policy making. So what do we do uh, uh, as real-time modelers? Uh, and it's a bit of a dense slide, but actually it's a bit of a lot of repetition with nuances. So uh, forecast scenarios of prediction. So forecast is a set of uh, future outcome associated with the probability distribution. So for example, a uh, number of bed with COVID patients at a certain date uh, with associated uh, uncertainty. Projections is uh, seen as an extension of the current trajectory. So you have a model and you fit your model uh, using your real time uh, and you do some sort of extension, but you assume that all the parameters uh, remain the same, knowing that things like uh, for example, uh, the way people behave will change. So projection is, is what it is, but it's uh, not forecast. Uh, scenario is exploration of future, uh, uh, future trajectory based on fitted uh, parameters and additional assumptions. For example, uh, you can uh, look at the change of transmission following a policy decisions. Uh, on top of this, you've got different type of scenarios. So I think the two most important ones are the central scenario, 
Uh, it's a scenario which is often highlighted as the closest to a forecast. So it's not a forecast, but it's supposed to be uh, close to what you expect. Uh, and, but it might still depend on, on, on a policy decision. So if you feed uh, um, policymakers with a central scenario, uh, they might still decide to go on uh, something which is different. Uh, reasonable worst case scenario is a type of scenario where assumptions are taken as the worst possible but remain plausible and this uh, rely on expert opinion. So uh, depending on the expert, you, you might have different uh, input to this uh, worst case scenario. Finally, predictions, I think I would say it's broadly synonymous with forecast but less technical and it will likely be used in, in, in the news or, or people uh, uh, arguing that uh, model predictions are not uh, predicting the right thing. Uh, now cast, and that's an interesting one, I think it's a relatively new term, but it's a set of outcomes describing the current situation associated with the probability distribution. And the reason why we need uh, now cast is that most of the time we don't really know, know, know a lot of things about uh, current uh, uh, so uh, markers, so for example, how many infection is there? Uh, so you've got estimate for data, but the, the estimate will be, uh, we, we lag and sometimes we have uncertainty. So there's a whole uh, field about trying to understand the current situation. So what we do is the projection scenario, uh, the central and the reasonable worst case and now cast, but we don't do forecast or predictions because we consider that we cannot really predict, uh, for example, uh, uh, the way people will be change their behaviors or things like, like, like that. So we prefer to uh, think that projection, the assumption are clearer. Uh, so um, then in terms of a model, there's different models and different purposes. So there's not one real type of uh, model. And uh, I'm going to talk to uh, the one I've been uh, uh, involved with. And um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, so in, 2000, in the spring 2020, uh, so we are quite a big department and there's a lot of uh, different models available, most of them related with flu and SARS, but uh, roughly you can have a line of uh, more and more complex model uh, with more and more uh, transmission mechanism and heterogeneities incorporated. Uh, and probably a good example of this is the model by Tagus uh, et uh, al, which was used for uh, our assessment of the uh, uh, need for a lockdown. Uh, so it's, it's been uh, it's been cited as a, um, described as a sort of simplicity of models, or but I mean it's very a model which is very detailed with a lot of uh, special structure and different uh, household, school, etc. workplaces. Uh, on the other kind of end of a spectrum, you have kind of almost um, uh, uh, model which are based on, for example, renewable equations where you don't have a lot of uh, structure of transmission. Uh, but more of a relationship between the different data streams. And obviously these simple models are much easier to fit uh, to the data streams, uh, but somehow you cannot um, use them for counterfactuals. So you have to really uh, strike something in the in between the middle, something intermediate, which is uh, simple enough to be able to be fitted in uh, real time, but complex enough to be used for uh, look at, uh, at, at policy scenario. So uh, in, in, in the kind of list of things we wanted is that we wanted to be able to incorporate the most important transmission mechanism, uh, focusing on, on uh, healthcare pathways because we uh, at, the, at the time you knew that it was very important for, for COVID. Uh, with fine uh, uh, edge structure, stochastic for, for being able to, to um, for different reasons, but one is for when small number of cases, it's kind of described better but what's happening using ODIN, which is a, a language which is a, allowed to generate fast C code, uh, able to fit to multiple data stream and fit it with a, a particle filter and particle uh, MCMC. So some of our contribution uh, to uh, UK uh, evidence for uh, policy. Uh, so we've been uh, most weekly um, uh, uh, feeding uh, policymakers or, or, or different uh, institutions with uh, now cast of uh, several epidemiological estimates, uh, such as the R numbers, virus prevalences, uh, and growth rates, etc. Uh, Medium-term projections of uh, epidemiological indicator, 
uh, and you can see uh, on the uh, left, uh, so this is a, a combine of different models. So one, um, uh, each of these uh, line will be a different kind of scenario uh, for, for short uh, medium term projection. Uh, and, and this would be the result of different groups, of not only us, but uh, you can see that uh, it's useful for policymakers because they can see that at a certain uh, change point, and this one during uh, this was doing the roadmap uh, in the UK of lifting the restriction during the spring 2020. Uh, you can see that um, different assumptions uh, lead to different trajectories. And later on, when data arrive on, on, on station, you can see on which trajectory you, you see it. Uh, this one is uh, another. Um, so it was, sorry, uh, it's 2021, uh, spring 2021. Uh, and this one is, is early on, is a reasonable worst case. I think it's never been really official, but uh, as it's been leaked to a, 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 new, uh, a newspaper, uh, it's kind of available online. Uh, and you can see the, uh, uh, it's comparing uh, the reasonable worst case that uh, we produce with um, the actual death. Uh, so, uh, allowing to kind of have a measurement of uh, how in this case bad we, we were doing uh, so and informing a lot sort of a lot of uh, other departments so we did also work on, on circuit breakers and reposition of mpi during autumn uh, 2020 uh, all of us are, are available on, on the government website uh, uh, but um, this is the early 21 20, uh, spring 2021 uh, roadmap modeling. So uh, at the same time, the vaccine was uh, rolled out. Uh, so there was a scope for lifting uh, some of the NPI, which has been uh, uh, imposed at the end of uh, 2020. Um, and what you can see is that you can do this counterfactual where you see, uh, look at different scenario. Uh, you can see the central scenario I was mentioning before, uh, and two kind of uh, one uh, two two sort of pessi more pessimistic uh, scenario based on 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 pessimistic efficacy of the vaccine uh, and, and kind of pessimistic in terms of adherence to uh, NPI uh, for for the population. And this would be different uh, kind of uh, introduction of lifting the uh, NPI. Uh, this is uh, something on um, still on the roadmap because of the massive amount of work. And this is linked with the appearance of Delta. So uh, when uh, Delta appear, I think the uh, roadmap uh, uh, step uh, kind of in, in introduction of, of lifting. Uh, so the, the, uh, the way it was designed is that uh, every before uh, lifting the, 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 the NPI, uh, so uh, kind of progressing lifting. Uh, so for, for to go to the next step, there would be an evaluation, and this actually evaluation following the emergence of Delta, and uh, the actually the step was delayed following uh, uh, the modeling. So qu quite a lot of contribution to to evidence policy during almost two years now. Uh, I, I want to uh, a bit reflect on on, on this uh, real time modeling and. and in terms of uh, uh, models and data and policy making. Uh, so what I have to say is that it's been really a, a changing landscape uh, and you might have or not in mind the met metaphors of the uh, Red Queen. So uh, this uh, um, in, in, in uh, uh, Alice uh, is trying to, uh, is running at some point and, and at some point she realized uh, so with the Red Queen, she realized that she hasn't moved. And she's looking around and says, I've been running quite a lot. Well, I'm not moving. And the red, red queen is telling her, oh, it's actually, um, I'm not sure where you're living, but here you have to, to run fast to, to stay at the same place. And it gives a bit of this impression that we have with real-time modeling is with the situation be, being more and more complex. So uh, now we have a new variants. Uh, so we had transition from uh, wild type to alpha, alpha to delta, delta to Omicron. Now we have vaccines and, and all the complications of uh, knowing who is vaccinated, etc., and the boosters. And, um, in terms of so the uh, the effect of a lot of things that becomes more uh, complicated to predict. So what in terms of the immunity, uh, how immunity work in terms of vaccine and infection waning or cross immunity in a, in a complex uh, kind of immunity landscape, population behavior we don't really know. Uh, and the time series are, are longer and longer. Uh, and uh, actually, we need to, to some extent, fit to from the beginning of the uh, um, uh, transmission, because if we change the model, we, we need to see how the change in the model impact, uh, the, for example, the building of immunity and 
how the, we need to refit uh, baby elephant. Uh, and um, so also we have been, we, we have need to really include more data set to inform different components of the model. So all of this has a cost, but that means that uh, uh, we're using PMCMC, which is quite um, uh, demanding in terms of uh, computer, uh, 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 computer um, performances. Uh, and basically to be able to produce every week results for, uh, uh, to advise the UK government, it's really, really been, been a challenge. Uh, and we're roughly producing the same thing from, from where we were in March uh, or in April 2020 when we started. Uh, the other question is about big data. Um, is it, are we talking about big data, but is it big obsolete, obsolete data? And uh, uh, for example, in March 2020, we were really lacking data, but uh, we were still living in the uh, area of uh, big data. So for example, uh, I'm thinking of the uh, uh, BBC pandemic, uh, uh, which collected a lot of data about uh, contact, but uh, this data were not telling you what would be uh, the impact of uh, uh, lockdown in terms of contact for reduction, for example. So it, it, it is very interesting data, but can be not uh, relevant to, to the uh, modeling question. Uh, in December 2021, uh, for example, we couldn't really inform at the beginning the degree of immunity in the escape versus increased transmission and change in severity for o uh, Omicron. So we had a lot of data about um, Delta and uh, a lot of Alpha and et cetera, but, but it was difficult to transpose this to, to Omicron. So there's really a question of, of, of big data and, and the sometimes small data, but, but relevant data. Uh, so uh, I want to just to, to, uh, uh, to keep on my, my reflection on, on uh, we really need to understand the, the decision pipeline. And, and so um, you have here a lot of data streams and, and models, a lot of models as well. We will produce a, a set of uh, outcomes um, with projections or, or scenarios. Uh, and this will be translated, we don't really know how, but in policy making decisions and other decision will feed. And all of this has a cost. I mean, data is extremely, the surveillance data is extremely costly. Model probably a bit less, but still uh, has a cost. And, and the decision will have an impact in terms of uh, 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 expected uh, economic impact and also expected quality of uh, uh, life uh, set or, or quality, better quality of life. Um, uh, and there's a lot of question about this. One is, um, we don't really understand, for example, uh, I mean, there's this work, but I think there should be much more work done on uh, how the choice of the data, the choice of the model uh, uh, kind of um, influence the, uh, the precision of the outcome. Or, or, uh, and I think it's not so well understood which data stream, and there might be data stream which are cheaper and, and actually produce the, the, the uh, uh, a better outcome and what is what the impact of a choice of models? I mean, here it's I mean you don't want to criticize model and saying one one modeling group is better than the other, but probably some models are better than others, and we need to to do I think an evaluation. evaluation. Uh, but on all this pipeline, I think the, the, the less known even is really how outcome are used by uh, policymakers to make the decision. Which one is important? Uh, is producing R now something important or is it really uh, uh, useless? I mean, so all these questions, I think uh, it would be interesting to look at. And the idea would be that if you have an answer to really the, the, how this pi pipeline work, you can this, use this to optimize the current surveillance system uh, because at some point we need to scale down uh, our surveillance system. Uh, and also we might be able to um, to plan more resilient uh, uh, kind of surveillance uh, scheme, which can be scaled up in case of a future pandemic and to avoid this problem that we didn't have any, any data in, in uh, uh, March 2020. For this, we really, we, there's a necessity of a multidisciplinary study, uh, including health economics, modeling, and social science, because I suspect that a lot of the decision uh, 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 should be studied with, with like uh, social sciences type of methods. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of, of our, our experience, I think it's quite important. Something important we have stressed is uh, to uh, really provide uh, robustness and reproducibility. So all our code is public and uh, we've created a series of packages, which hopefully will be uh, 
a legacy for 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 the post pandemic. Um, so you, there's a uh, all all um, so a package which we can be uh, looked at here. And uh, yeah, I think that that's mainly it. I think uh, I think we really should use this opportunity of all this effort, modeling effort, to really rethink uh, uh, the surveillance of uh, respiratory pathogen uh, post pandemic, and also uh, plan for future pandemic. And uh, yeah, of course, I mean, the, this has been a huge uh, amount of people involved, in particular, uh, colleague, uh, the real uh, time modeling uh, team. And uh, so all the, we like to thank all the data provider, uh, in particular colleagues at like UTHSA and, and the React one. Uh, yeah, hey. that's. Thank you very much, Mark, for that very useful overview. There's a couple of questions that come in the chat, but they're, they're quite bored. So I think in the interest of time, we're going to move on and hopefully in the panel discussion, we can revisit some of these issues. So um, over to you, Martin, for the final talk. Right. Thank you so much, Adam. And yes, um, our, our final uh, speaker is Tom Abbott. So uh, Sam is the research fellow in the epidemiology um, at the school, and he's going to tell us about real-time analysis case studies. So what do you, Sam, please? Thank you. I don't think we can hear you, um, Sam. Sorry about that. You should be able to hear me now, hopefully. Yeah, I can hear you now. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Excellent. So I'm going to be giving a bit of a whistle-stop tour today through some of the real-time COVID work that I've been involved with over the last two years and trying to pick out some lessons for the future. Um, I think it's really good. Mark just gave a really great introduction about uh, what real-time modelling is. And there's quite a lot of overlap in this talk. So I think that should be quite interesting, hopefully. So firstly, I just want to reflect on this quote from a paper by Chris Whitty in 2015 which says uh, an 80% right paper before a policy decision is made is worth 10, 95% right papers afterwards, provided the methodological limitations imposed by doing it fast are made clear. And this in my mind is, is really, you know, what real-time modeling is. It's, it's evidence when it's needed, not when it's not needed. Um, and I think hidden in this quote, there's something else as well, which is uh, it's very hard to define what 80% good enough is. And typically it's the work is available not any other measure of quality. And I think there's a lot of interesting lessons for us to learn about how we can make this work better in the future. So I've split the case studies up into sort of two sections, the first being a sort of like preemptive work. And this is work where, you know, you may not have an analysis question or you're doing it beforehand. You, you can, you can plan to do it beforehand. And then reactive examples where policy questions occur and for whatever reason, tools don't exist. So you have to do work very quickly on very short timelines to inform decisions. Uh, and hopefully we'll see how those two things uh, flow into each other. So firstly, I'm going to go through the preemptive examples. And the first one is effective reproduction number estimation. Uh, and I think, so firstly, the effective reproduction number is the average number of secondary infections produced by a uh, single infected person, and it can vary over time. And I think, um, it's various stages of the pandemic, it's perhaps been overly focused on, but regardless, it's still a very useful uh, quantity for tracking underlying transmission, especially when used with other measures. Unfortunately, it's quite hard to estimate because it depends on unobserved infections and also on the interval between primary and secondary infections, which is uh, known as the generation interval. And, and this can be very hard to estimate. Um, we, along with uh, Mark's group and, and others have been estimating uh, effective reproduction number since February, 2020. Uh, each week as part of the SPIM consensus um, and also publicly on uh, over a thousand locations since April 2020 every day uh, at epiforecast.io slash COVID. And the sort of key challenges with reproduction number estimation are one, linking it to policy changes and doing that in real time is really difficult because one of the only things we have available is delayed proxies, things like reported deaths, reported cases, uh, and those, they're, they're firstly delayed, so you have to reconstruct infections at some earlier time, and also they have a range of biases that are really difficult to account for. And even when you can account for those biases, you're left with a model that can be really computationally challenging, especially in the Bayesian framework, which I think a lot of us are using. Uh, and that can be really difficult to, to deploy across a lot of locations in real time, um, and this was especially true in early 2020. So, to mitigate some of these issues, firstly, we came up with quite a nice uh, general model of latent infections. This sits somewhere towards the left of Mark's um, continuum of models, somewhere slightly more complicated than ANCORI's renewal framework, but slightly less complicated than their work on SAR COVID. Um, but this model had quite a long runtime, so we worked with the Met Office to develop production-ready code. Uh, 
And then we use computational resources donated, donated by Microsoft Azure to run in the cloud at scale, which is not something we'd usually be able to do and was absolutely necessary. Um, and then finally, it's very difficult to know fully if you've unpicked all the biases between data sources. So we looked at a, multi, a range of data sources and then compared these to try and get some understanding and hopefully try to communicate that idea to people consuming these estimates. So they didn't just average across reproduction numbers blindly, but sort of looked at the underlying data sources they were based on to unpick some more meaning. And also, as Mark said, one of the really important parts of this work is making sure everything's open source, available as like a, a readily reusable tool uh, for others to make use of. So we did that with, with our work. Um, and I think one of the really important bits about that was one, it allowed other groups that maybe didn't have the resources or have the, um, or uh, well, or just for various reasons couldn't to use our tool in, in contexts that were useful for them. So in like, public health institutes, for example, but also really crucially, because our model was like purposely easy to run, they could compare it to their methods and therefore develop best methods. And I think that's, that's really key. So for me, the lessons learned here is preemptive work is a really useful way to gain uh, situational awareness. And also it's really key that the outputs are robust modular, they're evaluated, you check their work, and also they're actually available. Because in many times, code's not available, data's not available, or there are very various hoops to jump through. So the next example I'm going to touch on is short-term forecasting. And in this context, that is trying to uh, uh, predict what's going to happen to reported metrics, things like test positive cases, over the next one to four weeks. So not, not, not a projection, you're trying to actually predict what's going to happen. And this is very difficult to do. Um, but it's a useful way to validate models, because if you can do it, that shows that your understanding of what's happening now is probably quite good. Uh, and we did this using our reproduction number model and also similar models that are based on discrete convolutions and submitted both to SPIEM initially three times a week up to mid-2020, but also to the ECDC and CDC uh, forecasting hubs, which are these large scale collaborations where multiple groups submit forecasts, they're evaluated against each other, then they're ensembled to produce a more reliable, robust forecast for decision makers to use. And what we found was our model compared quite well to others. It wasn't necessarily the best in all situations, but generally not the worst. And our ability to now cast was sort of validated in that our model was able to be, be used as a short-term forecaster. However, we were dramatically outperformed by the ensemble. Our forecasts were much less robust than the ensemble of all models. And we found some nice work by uh, Nikos Boss that a human judgment model, which is an ensemble of people's opinion, really outperformed our forecasting in Germany and Poland over quite a long time span, which I think is something that's quite interesting. Uh, and then finally, we found it very difficult to forecast policy changes, and there's a lot more research to do into that area. So the lessons learned from this work, again, preventive work is useful, but also here combining estimates leads to much more robust, accurate estimates that are hopefully more useful for decision-making. So really relying on a single analysis is not a good idea. So the last uh, example here is now casting. I'm gonna skip it, it's fascinating, but sadly, no time. Uh, and move on to reactive examples. So the first reactive example I'm gonna cover is estimating the transmission advantage of variants of concern, which uh, was initially not something we were thinking about and suddenly became a very pressing issue. So the first of these was obviously alpha and it was, was, uh, was alpha more transmissible than wild type. Looking back to 2020, it seems like a long time ago, but alpha spread from Kent across the country. And there was a lot of concern about, about what was driving that. We took part in a multi-method uh, evaluation by led by Nick Davies. We used our reproduction number estimates as a data input and combined it with S gene target failure data, which is a proxy for sequence data. Uh, and what that meant was because we'd used, we'd already dealt with a lot of the data issues when we were estimating the reproduction number, we were able to have a much more simple method to estimate the transmission advantage that was basically just an extended regression. And, and that was still you know fairly principled, provide a fairly good estimate, but was we could do it very quickly. So this work was done uh, between, between December 20th and January 1st. So a very short time horizon when people are on holiday. Um, and that was like eight, eight or nine different, different teams putting work together there. And what we saw was top right-hand corner figure is our estimates you know, are in line with others, but the overall ensemble of all methods gave a much more robust estimate and was much better for generating scenarios of what was like to happen, which is what Nick then went and did. Uh, and then similarly, Delta, when Delta was spreading, we did very similar work uh, to see if it was more transmissible than alpha. And the nice thing about this was because all our code, all our methods are all open source and all available to be used, we just deployed them again, made some slight adjustments to improve the methodology to better handle uncertainty and produce an estimate that was then used in the spine consensus. Uh, and then lastly, this is more of the same, estimate the transmission advantage of Omicron versus Delta. But here, the additional nuance was we were really interested to see if it varied over time. 
And this is because there was quite a lot of evidence early on from South Africa that Omicron may be more successful than Delta escaping prior immunity. And this would show up as a variation over time in the transmission advantage. And our previous method absolutely couldn't handle this, nor could I think virtually all of the methods being used at the time. So this was a real problem. And given how fast Omicron was spreading, uh, it was really key that there was some, there was some estimates of, of what was happening. Um, fortunately, we were able to repurpose some of our methodology that we'd been developing to evaluate the role of sequences for short-term forecasting, which was in another package, our package called uh, Forecast Box. And this allowed us to estimate time-varying transmission advantages and produce a real-time report that was Smith's IM and updated daily in public from the 18th of December to the 1st of January. So again, very short timelines, unfortunately, sadly, again over Christmas. Uh, and this allowed us to identify a reduction in the transmission advantage prior to Christmas. And this was quite surprising because what we expected to see if there'd been a, a lot of immune escape was an increase in the transmission advantage. So this was a really interesting finding and something that this sort of like surveillance approach led us to identify quite quickly. And so the key lesson again here from all of these examples is that real-time analysis, you know, it really builds on previous work, previous analyses, previous tools and data pipelines. So here, like the UKHSA for data pipeline, uh, that you really need to be in existence in order to do this work well. Uh, and then also, again, much like in the short-term forecasting and in other projects, combining estimates gives you much more robust findings that hopefully lead to better decision-making because there's you know, less uncertainty and less bias. And then just my final example is talking about estimating the change in generation time, which actually worked from the last uh, month. And this came about because this observed reduction we saw in the transmission advantage for Omicron. One of the potential ex explanations for that is that Omicron had a shorter generation time than Delta. And this was also one of the hypotheses around why uh, cases in South Africa turned over so much faster than expected. And we did this by exploiting the relationship between the growth rate and the reproduction number, which is in the top right hand corner here, detailed in the Parker Tell paper I've linked, fantastic paper, recommend reading it. And what we found was shorter generation time was plausible. On the right hand side, the figure is how our model mapped to our data. So it's you know, pretty good. Uh, and this, these findings have been supported by some of the other studies. It's still very hard to know if it's, it's entirely correct, but they also uh, were available in early January and form part of the SPIAM consensus statement. So again, findings here, again, building on other work here, the time varying transmission work, and the real key here is work that's good enough is work that's available because there really was very few, very little work because it was also happening so fast. So just to wrap up, um, yes, the really important lessons learned for me, preemptive work, really useful way to gain situational awareness, real-time analysis builds on analyses, tools, and data pipelines that have been previously developed and ideally made publicly available. Uh, it's easiest to do this when the things you're using are robust, modular, they've been checked to work and they're available. It's really important to combine estimates from a range of sources and methodologies. Um, and work that's good enough is at the moment work that's just available. And I think my, my personal takeaways from this was that we can achieve higher standards if we have more teamwork, we do more preemptive work and we do more evaluation. But in my view, these are really poorly incentivized. I found doing this work incredibly challenging, uh, incredibly hard. And I felt very undertrained, both in terms of statistical methodology, software engineering and public communication of limitations. And I, I really feel that this skill set is really poorly rewarded in um, by traditional academic incentives, and it's really difficult to acquire. So those things I feel like could really do with being changed. But anyway, thank you very much for listening. Thanks to my group, the Pew Forecasts, for feedback on this talk. Thank you for my collaborators for this wonderful work, which I've stolen. Uh, and if you'd like to see any more of that work, it's all linked in the slides, and the slides are linked here. Thanks very much. And thank you so much, um, uh, Sam, for a really interesting presentation. Uh, unfortunately, in the interest of time, we have to move on to the uh, panel uh, the discussion. And I hope um, some of the questions that uh, colleagues may want to ask will come up uh, during that period. So again, thank you so much. And I'm going to look at the open uh, uh, chat for questions. Whilst I'm waiting for that, um, maybe I have a quick question for Sam. Sam, you know, uh, one of the challenges in low, again, low and middle income countries, just like in, in, in the Gambia, is for uh, the how to produce data in real time that could be used for uh, uh, modeling. So that's one big challenge. And the, the, the second challenge, if you take COVID, for example, a, a lot of institutions, a lot of ministers of health do not perform detection 
And it, 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 let's say load whole genome sequencing in order to identify the, the, the lineage that may be causing a specific outbreak. So I just wonder if you have any thoughts around that whilst we're waiting for colleagues to, uh, to open up. So thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's a really interesting question, and I think it, you know it's it's largely unsolved. Um, but one of the things I do think is really exciting is this idea of doing more sort of like cross-sectional studies, like more like very low sample size cross-sectional studies where you use sort of novel metrics, like for example, uh, cycle thresholds from PCR, and use that additional information to build a build a more complex picture of what's happening on the ground. And I think like statistical methodology to de-bias very sparse data. And population level data and get more individual level learning from it there's quite a lot of linkages between population level statistical methods and individual level statistical methods that you could you know link them together and therefore get a better picture overall so that would be what i would hope to see more work on, done on for, for that, those sorts of use cases all right okay thank you shall i pass to adam please um yes yeah, so hopefully between us we can we can cover a range of questions um so there's one that came up that it was originally a question to Natalie, but I think a variant of it could, could really apply to a, a lot of the panellists. Um, and that was what would be the most valuable actions to take in between outbreaks? Uh, in the case of Natalie's talk to, to, to launching a trial, but for others to perhaps launching the, these kinds of analyses. And um, the, the person who asked the question was thinking whether it's in terms of, um, uh, you know, of resources, of surveillance, of comms, of governance. Um, you know, what do we need to be doing between... Uh, pandemic. So maybe Natalie first, and I'd, I'd be keen to hear other panelists' thoughts as well. Yeah, just offer a few things. I mean, this has been some of the, the focus of different groups like the WHO's R&D Blueprint and CEPI, um, and, and just figuring out what you can do in sort of peacetime uh, to, to be prepared. And I mean, for vaccines, obviously, advancing the testing of the vaccines themselves through the early phases. But, um, but also, yeah, getting some of that epidemiological understanding of um, for particular pathogens that we know that are understudied and sort of really building our, our evidence base with um, serological studies and, and increasing surveillance. Um, yeah, I think also, you know, trying to build out uh, collaborations and networks and how, like thinking about how um, people will come together to, to conduct trials and, um, and Build, building teams. Um, I think that's another thing is, is thinking about those, those how those collaborations will form as well. And anyone else have thoughts on kind of other aspects of, uh, of these, these kinds of analyses, what we should be doing between outbreaks? Sam? So I, I sort of covered it in my talk, but I think it's really key we actually evaluate what we have and what works and what doesn't work and then improve those methods and make them something that can actually be used. Because my experience in early 2020 was there was just very little that could actually be used and was deployable. And I think the other thing that would be really important is focusing, the, making sure you have people in place who have the skills that you need in order to do this work quickly, because it does require a different skill set to like traditional academic work. And as I said, I don't think it's very well supported. Yeah, I think that, that comment you made was resonating in some of the comments that are coming in on questions. Um, Martin, was there an, another question you want to go with? Yeah, I was just going to say there are very few questions uh, relating to some um, comments about the fact that um, modeling is not re re rewarded. So there's, there's a lot of questions around that. And, and some of them wondered if Sam has any thoughts about how uh, statisticians or mathematicians could be re rewarded accordingly. So I wonder if you have any comments, please. Uh, I personally think a, a more sort of like team approach to science would be helpful. More team funding, more team infrastructure would be sort of quite crucial because then you can have people with different skills and, and different different roles. Um, and uh, yeah, I think funding that better reflects the, the wide diversity of scientific outputs as opposed to just, you know, high impact peer review publications would be really useful because there's been a lot of um, real time work being shoehorned into papers when it really didn't need to be during the pandemic. And a lot of that time could have been spent on doing more real time analysis, I think. All right, okay, okay. On that on that point, I'd be interested to hear from um, Elizabeth. With with Open Safely, you've obviously got these pipelines set up. You know, there was work pre COVID. I mean, how does that work? And and chime with some of the things you've heard um, on the kind of real time modeling side. Well, it's certainly the case that a lot of the work involved in the Open Safely, um, well, papers and products are not traditionally incentivized. So the software engineers did an awful lot of work that traditionally would just you know, go on in the background and 
And so we've got a lot of authors on all, all of our work. And sometimes they don't meet the traditional, you know, authorship criteria, but we agreed early on that there had to be ways of rewarding people that were currently valued. But I think perhaps just a different structure where we we value these things outside of publications. So I think maybe just more of a broader rethink about what gets you promotions and grants and how, how we value things. Yeah. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, I've seen a question from, I think, Jackie Oliver, I hope I've got it wrong. And, and this is to Mark, actually. So she wanted to know, at which point do you engage with policymakers? Uh, and do they supply you with um, policy questions, et cetera? Uh, Mark? Yeah, so in, in the UK, we have a, a quite well established uh, structure. So we are part of the uh, uh, SPIM group, which is um, composed of a lot of uh, academic institutions. And uh, there's a secretariat, which are a uh, civil servant. Uh, and these people will uh, attend government meetings and, and things. And they have been extremely good at uh, uh, kind of uh, being bridging between uh, uh, so, so telling policymakers what's possible uh, for the model to do, uh, working very extra hard to uh, really passing from one to the other. So we don't engage directly with policymakers. Uh, so the, the questions, the commissions, uh, so called, will, will come to us um, usually on a Friday uh, uh evening for 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 the next uh, wednesday or something or tuesday but anyway and that's another sort of thing but but so the commission comes with, with different questions which are uh, usually set up as, as, as modeling questions so they, they are uh so, so the, the translation from from the, the policy question to uh the modeling will have been kind of ensured by versus uh spam secretariat and right. this, this, then, then it doesn't go directly as well to policymakers and then go to Sage uh, and, and then um, Patrick Valence or whoever represent uh, the, the kind of scientific advisor, we will take this on board or other, at least is what I understand from, from the process. Okay, I, I'm just wondering if you know the speakers have any experience in engaging with policymakers, say in, in low middle income countries, such as in Africa, like the African Union or West African Health Organization? Probably not. Okay, I'll pass on to Adam. I think, I mean, carrying on that point of engaging the policymakers, I mean, I, I think, because obviously Sam and Mark have talked about um, that process through SPIM, and I think that's something where sometimes sort of public perception of how that works is quite different to the kind of the questions coming down, that, that quite routine kind of feedback results. But I'd be interested to hear sort of from Nathalie and Elizabeth, your, your experiences of, um, of engaging with policymakers. I mean, Nathalie, you mentioned the WHO on the blueprint um, uh, a while ago. I mean, in terms of these, uh, these different bits of work, how, how have you found the kind of the timelines and, and what the audiences for those have been? Yeah, I mean, I, so from the US perspective, uh, you know, I think things are just structured differently and they're, you know, um, there are uh, structures in place like to, for the, the modeling and to, to bring the modeling together and, and then, you know, that are through like CDC, but there's also been some kind of just grassroots efforts um, like scenario modeling hub and trying to really hone in on, on some of these um, questions, I you know this is I think there's a gap and a lot to learn from other places in terms of you know particularly in the UK in terms of these decision making processes and just you know I like that the modeling goes up to um, other scientists and then you know that there's there's these levels there and 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 a, and a structure and the data streams are made available I think it's another challenge is sort of just data availability and, and standardization. And so that's really been the impetus behind um, this new uh, this new uh, body that is being funded by the U.S. government that is being planned now, um, like a, a forecasting hub. So I think there's a real there's a real need um, because things have been disjointed. And um, Elizabeth, on the the insights from Open Safely, I mean, I'd be interested to know the kind of the routes to um, to sort of policymakers and groups for those. <laughs> 
Yeah, so my personal involvement with policy has been largely through the JCBI, the Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, but we've been, as a collaborative, we've been involved in lots of different policy groups. But my personal experience is, has been really positive in that I've been given really clear questions um, that were answerable using my data. And really the only difficult part uh, from my perspective was the deadlines. So uh, at one point I was asked to, to answer a research question, which we normally would have put a grant application for 18 months, maybe two years for, and I had two weeks. So it's a lot more challenging. <laughs> I know the feeling it feels like someone's taking a decimal place off your um, your timelines. Um, Martin, were there uh, was there any other questions you wanted to follow up on? I was muted. I, I know this is not covered, but I just wondered if the panelists have any experience working with verbal autopsy data and that is collected in Africa for decision making. I, I, I know it's difficult to collect that, uh, of course, during pandemic, but uh, this could be a, a retrospective type of data that could be used for future planning. No, it looks like, no, okay. Um, I think Richard was asking a question only, but I can't find uh, the, uh, the chart. So should I pass to Adam for now? Okay, yeah, we're getting lots of great questions in, which is fantastic, but it just means we just take a moment to navigate. This is Okay, so here's a good one. But I think for Sarah and Nui, directed at Sam, but um, I think everyone will have kind of views on this about kind of the understanding of what models and statistics can and can't do, um, particularly outside science. So policymakers is obviously one, media is another, um, and, and then the general public. So I'd be interested to hear from... The, the panelists, kind of their experience of, of whether they feel that they've been able to get their message across, have there been kind of frustrations in that process? So should we just start, as I can see people on my screen with Sam? Sure, I mean, I think for me, it's not something I've really engaged with massively. And I think that's mainly because I don't really know how to do it, uh, like the, commun the communication aspect. Uh, which I think is is really not not ideal, and I think the sort of traditional scientific communication via a paper is not ideal uh, for 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 communicating those limitations. I think like a much more simplified document. I think despite the spine consensus statements do quite a good job, but even more than that would be good. Um, but yes, I'd love to know more about it. Um, and um, maybe Elizabeth, in terms of interpretation of a lot of those those headline results, how, what, what are your experiences there? I found that. The media, or particular journalists, have been very keen to make sure that they understand my work. So individuals have been really conscientious and very thoughtful. But of course, as soon as something's in the Twitter sphere, it's a lot harder to control the message. And like Sam, I think it's something that I haven't done very well and I would very much like to be better at. And um, any thoughts from Natalie or, or Mark on that point? I think it really depends on, on who you are uh, talking to. I mean, if it's a science journalist, which is generally interested in, in the science, it's much easier. But quite often people, especially in the question around, you know, lockdown, I think you have politically motivated uh, people who don't have an interest into uh, carrying the limitation or the uncertainty or whatever you would like to communicate. So it, it really depends on the person. I think, I think we're not really trained with uh, communicating outside of scientific uh, journal, that's something. Uh, but also, I think sometimes there's a, it's a malicious type of uh, uh, driven people I mean, for political agenda. I'll, I'll just add, you know, I spent a fair amount of time talking to different journalists and reporters and just about sort of the interpretation of some of these studies. I mean, sometimes that's, it's directly solicited, like as almost like a formal peer review of a preprint or something. And um, it's, it's a whole interesting way of, yeah, of doing science and interacting with science. Um, but I think one thing I've really tried to get across is just the limitations of models. And, you know, like, for example, projecting, you know, in the fall, projecting forward into the winter. And it's like, okay, well, there's a lot of 
uh, and this past winter, you know, uh, a lot of immunity and things are going down and, you know, but, but just trying to express my own caution that, okay, but the model incorporates what it knows and it can incorporate all the sort of the weird things that can be just around the corner and uh, Omicron being a clear example of that. And so I think just really trying to um, explain the blind spots of models and, uh, and helping people understand that and, and how to use it as, as a, a way to think about the future. Okay, so um, we have about five minutes uh, for the end of the panel and discussion. And I, I just wondered if, if um, I, I could hear your thoughts. And it's, a, it's a great question about what, what is one thing that you would change in February 2020, given what we know now? <laughs> and I, I think the, it's a fantastic question. I, I wonder if each of the uh, panelists could take 10 and, 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 and answer the question, please. So perhaps we could start uh, with, with Elizabeth, please, and then we go on to uh, Natalie, Mark, and then Sam, please. Elizabeth. Well, I think the main thing I would have done differently was pace myself a bit more, because for me, the, the first three months, I don't think I slept, and it was a little exhausting. So if, I think if I'd known that it was going to be a much longer thing, I might have just taken it a bit easier to start with. <laughs> All right, thanks. And I want, Natalie, please, as you think about that, I want you to think about what happens in developing countries like in, in Africa where uh, data probably may not exist, please. I, I know it's challenging, but... Yeah, yeah well, yeah, well, I, you know, I think sometimes we have a bit of it, well, just given the urgency of the situation and sort of what's it, what's already in place and just the challenges of setting up new new things. Um, sometimes there's momentum just to say, okay, well, we don't have time to set up this thing, this you know, this this thing that's going to stay in place for you know and generate information. It takes time to kind sort of set up something big, but then we've seen that the the big things that once they get set up, that they turn out a lot of insights and, and that they're used heavily over a multi-year period and so I think sometimes not relying too much on like the way we've done done things and being willing to kind of um I, I just highlighting the importance of kind of setting up the, the new things that um can we can rely on uh over, over a substantial period of time right okay thanks so much this is a fantastic answer shall we hear from Mark please and then Sam thank you I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, yeah, I think the um, uh, what Elizabeth said about um, I think we didn't know it would last for two years, I and mean, something uh, it has been exhausting. But something which is interesting, I mean, it's not what it would change is that a lot of, I mean, it's quite interesting, and I mean, the case of a lot of people have said that it was very difficult to get funding for a lot of the questions we've been. Mm -hmm. uh, uh working for the next two years and it's interesting to see how things could have been different if maybe a bit more uh and it can be question of status or question of uh, not seeing it as a priority and think but i think i would have changed but it's not it was not in my uh i would have given more importance to some of the questions uh more general uh funding which is easy to say but i think it might have saved a lot of um work and, and probably lives as well all right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Sam, please, to wrap up. Uh, yeah. So I think, I mean, I share many of the feelings about, you know, the exhaustion and, and pacing. But I think for me, spending a lot more time focusing really in great detail on the biases in the surveillance data and in, in the very, like, near to now biases and how to unpick those. Because so I think in early 2020, a lot of those were kind of shoved under the rug, especially in, well, in my work. And it would have been useful to, to think about that more. Right, okay, so thank you so much. This is really great. And thanks to all the speakers and the panelists. It's been really a uh, fantastic discussion. Uh, I'll pass on to uh, Adam for the final uh, comments, please. So Adam. Yes, um, as Mark says, thank you so much to the panelists for some excellent discussion, excellent presentations. Thank you to everyone for asking um, very thought-provoking questions. Uh, and of course, for the audience to listen. Um, we're not um, at the end of this event and we're taking a short break. Um, so uh, go get yourself uh, a drink, some refreshment, uh, and then we'll be back at 5.30 on this same link um, for the second session. And welcome to our seminar.
We're focusing today on how mathematical and statistical models combine with big data to improve our response to pandemics. And this is the second part of our seminar. Thanks to everybody who's joined us today and everybody who participated in the first part of the seminar. And in the first part of the seminar, we heard fantastic talks focused on data sources, statistics, mathematical modeling approaches, and how all of those, all of that information was used to inform pandemic responses. And what we're doing in the second part of the seminar is we're looking in a more future focused way and we're talking about preparing for the next pandemic. I'm chairing the session this afternoon with Professor Liam Smith. Liam is the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And we're really lucky this afternoon to be joined by four fantastic speakers who are, who are globally renowned and have made huge contributions during the pandemic with expertise in research, and expertise in research that informs and decides public policy. And I'm very excited to hear all of the talks. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this afternoon is going to work. We have four talks and the talks themselves are brief. They're 10 minutes long. We're not going to stop for questions after each talk. But what I would really encourage you to do is to put your questions in the chat during the talk and at the end, we have a 40 minute panel discussion where we can address answering many of those questions. I suspect there are a lot of questions for this distinguished panel of speakers. So thank you all for participating. I'd now like to introduce the first speaker. And the first speaker is Professor Bramer Mukherjee from the University of Michigan. She's chair of biostatistics and professor of epidemiology and has an excellent track record in using big data to answer important questions. During the pandemic, she's played a critical role in using data to understand transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in India, and her work has been widely cited by a range of media sources. And I'm really excited to hear your talk, Ramar. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Shaniad. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Uh, I'd also like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this extremely distinguished panel. We are session two on 2-2-2022, two, two, quite a clustering of twos there, but hopefully two is the lucky number. I want to share some brief remarks today on how data can help us build a pandemic resilient future. My comments are based on our experience of modeling the pandemic in India for the last two years. I'd like to start with a quote by a trailblazing statistician, Dr. Janet Norwood, who was the first female commissioner of the Bureau of the Labor Statistics in the United States and fought tirelessly as a civil servant to improve the official data system. More than 25 years ago, she emphasized the necessity of high quality statistical series or real-time data, state-of-the-art models, and dynamic statistical agencies to govern policymaking. The pandemic has emphasized these principles. We need to stay prepared with a robust and comprehensive public health data system. Good data coupled with good models is at the heart of effective policymaking. In the remaining nine minutes, I want to make three points. The first is to give you a sense of how we got started on this modeling journey. The second is to share a data-driven framework for tiered public health interventions that I'll call PHI, same as NPI in Mark's talk. The last is to emphasize that we have many good models, but we most importantly need good data. Data denial, data opacity, and data paucity have hindered effective policymaking in India. The work that I'm presenting today is the collective effort of a large number of individuals. I want to acknowledge all of them and our funding. When we started modeling the pandemic in India in mid-March of 2020, India had about 500 cases and 10 deaths. The y-axis in this figure 
displaying daily reported cases is not in thousands that we have gotten used to, it is truly double digits. In a Medium article, we shared our initial projections for India, comparing its trajectory to that of Italy and the United States. At this point, there are no formal projections available for India. The model that we used was an off-the-shelf Bayesian SIR model, where the intervention effects of mitigation measures was modeled by a modifying schedule called pi of t. This pi will appear repeatedly in my talk, quantifying the change in the probability of transmission from infected to susceptibles. The model is essentially a latent Markovian stochastic system emitting dynamic transitions across compartments over time. In the beginning days of the pandemic, we made up values of this intervention effect pi t to create scenarios that demonstrate, say, the effect of lifting of lockdowns in a certain manner or the duration of lockdowns. The work received surprising media attention and was quoted as a key piece of evidence while considering India's highly controversial but very early national lockdown in 2020. India's historic national lockdown started on March 25 with an initial 21-day period, later extended to almost nine weeks. We saw many economic and social ramifications of the lockdown with the tragedy of the migrant workers unfolding and attempts at social galvanization through lighting of lamps in every household in India to eliminate the gloom of darkness. We had the foresight to build an app that updates relevant epidemiologic metrics for the nation and its states and union territories every day, including updated daily projections. The app has tirelessly been running for more than 600 days now and has become a go-to place for policymakers, epidemiologists, and media. I often get a call from the chairman of India's COVID task force to explain parameter choices or changes to the app. This app is probably the most important contribution we made as public health data scientists. As you can see from data till January 31, the third wave is winding down in India and there has been severe reduction in COVID deaths this time, almost one-fifth of what we saw from the Delta wave, thanks to a massive vaccination effort in India with 1.7 billion doses administered so far. However, India's second wave in 2021 will be written in public health history. A scathing Lancet editorial called it a self-inflicted national catastrophe. Despite the cautionary warnings from all real-time models, the rise of new variants and very low vaccination coverage at the time, the country did not rule out any appreciable PHIs. Instead, there are massive political rallies and religious gatherings with almost no usage of masks. When in late March or April of 2021, some of the states like Delhi or Maharashtra strengthen the PHIs, there was an immediate drop in cases, indicating such interventions were likely effective in India. But the key question was to figure out the optimal timing and the composition of the PHIs for the future. Though there has been some work to tease apart effect of common public health interventions like facial covering, school closing, and I have provided one recent reference here, we certainly need more work in this area to understand the effect of PHIs across geography and possibly create a worldwide catalog of effect sizes of these PHIs and a menu for dialing up and dialing down to aid policymaking. We recently proposed such a tiered framework to introduce and lift PHIs for the future that constitutes of three elements, launching triggers that could be epidemiologic metrics, healthcare capacity, vaccination coverage, tiers of public health actions, and the corresponding projections. For example, this is the effective R trajectory for India during wave two, and one can escalate to different color-coded tiers based on different thresholds of R values, along with consideration of other supporting metrics. <laughs> 
to understand the composition of each tier, we really studied interventions across in India, across India in granular detail. For example, this table shows what was done in Maharashtra, the Western state in India reporting the highest number of cases and deaths. The period of study is last March before a full lockdown. We map these public health actions to our recommended tiers. For example, in this case, the actions are mapped to the red tier representing strengthened non-lockdown PHIs. We then analyzed the case curve during wave two when different PHI tiers were ruled out at different times. And we did this for many places in India. We then study the effective R trajectory during the same period and observe the changes in R. Finally, we estimated intervention effect pies as the relative change in R with introduction of these PHIs during de different phases of pre-lockdown, lockdown, and unlock period. This gave us an ensemble of realistic pie schedules for different PHI tiers that resulted from actual actions that were ruled out in India instead of made up hypothetical ones. Finally, we take this tiered system and generate counterfactual death curves had the PHIs been applied at earlier dates, say in February or even in March. We find that with early and sustained interventions, one could avert nearly 200,000 reported deaths or more than 80% of the deaths during that time. The timing is the key more than the strength of the PHIs. A mid-April rollout of PHIs, even with lockdowns, was too late for an effective control of the virus. The same type of projections can be done for hospital or ICU beds to estimate what level of mitigation will allow the capacity not to be exceeded. Perhaps these are more relevant metrics for a vaccinated population moving forward. Politics and public health have been closely entangled in this pandemic. This MedArchive draft of this work got translated into memes blaming the government of inaction. This is an unavoidable discomfiture of working in this area and being vocal about data quality and data fidelity. In summary, as modelers, we must be humble about our knowledge and about our models and about our data. A good model to capture the complexity of the pandemic at this point will need various input list listed on this slide, including information on virus evolution and human behavior. Even if we work very hard with a great interdisciplinary team at each domain, it is a stochastic system in constant turmoil, always a few steps behind. But more than increasingly complex models, I do believe we need good data for India. It has been daunting to create better models for the Indian data as only subnational data are available in disaggregated forms, even by age and sex. There are huge gaps in death reporting. The linkage of testing, vaccination, sequencing, and clinical outcome data has not happened. I have been promoting a data wish list for 2022 and hoping someone is listening. The integrated national data from Public Health England, or we heard about Open Safely, the Clalit Health Systems in Israel have led to key discoveries in this pandemic. We need similar digital and intellectual ecosystems across the world. I'd like to end my comment with a quote by Dr. Norwood again, displayed on this slide. May we not be silent or quiet when we have something unique and important to say. Don't just publish your science, publicize it. Good data, good models, good visualization and communication tools will remain an essential part of our toolkit in battling the remainder of this pandemic and for staying prepared for the next one. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Bramar. What a fantastic talk, and I'm sure you'll inspire lots of different questions. I'm now going to hand over to my co-chair, Professor Liam Smith, who's going to introduce the next speaker. Thanks, Liam. Uh, thanks, Sinead, and thanks, Bramar, for that great talk. Uh, I'm Liam Smith, uh, Director of London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. i am uh, just finished clinic in the NHS, hence the highly glamorous backdrop 
behind me. Uh, I've been generating data all afternoon, in fact. So uh, it is a great pleasure and uh, my honour indeed to introduce the next speaker, who is Professor Dame Angela McLean, Chief Scientific Advisor, Ministry of Defence. And she is also the Director of the Institute for Emerging Infections of Humans, uh, a mathematical biologist by background. Angela, I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Lee, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I very much enjoyed this afternoon's presentations. Um, I'm going to start with one slide, if I could have the first slide, please, because I wanted to uh, show a little diagram of the, uh, the advisory system we have here in the UK. Uh, so this is an extremely simplistic view of where SAGE and SPY-M fit in. So I think I'm here today because with my colleague, Graham Medley of your parish, I am the co-chair um, of SPY-M. So SPY-M is a group of mainly uh, university-based academic mathematical modelers uh, who were already working together, many of them, uh, under a, a scheme that had been set up previously. So I think that's quite an important thing to learn was that this group certainly had roots of people who knew each other. When COVID started, a special thing called SPY-MO, where the O stands for operational, was set up, which actually is a subgroup of SAGE. So on that diagram, SAGE is the next thing round. SAGE stands for the Science Advisory, sorry, for Science Advice for Government Emergencies, Science Advice for Government in Emergencies. That was set up by John Beddington uh, in, the, in the past. And so and, uh, SAGE sort of comes and goes. It, it stands up and then disappears when emergencies are over. Uh, this emergency is extremely unusual in, in how long it's gone on for. Uh, and SAGE's job is to provide advice actually for a part of cabinet uh, that is called COBRA. COBRA stands for Committee Briefing Room A. And actually, Committee Briefing Room A is about as exciting as, uh, as it sounds. You know, it's got clocks and, and screens all over the place. Uh, I, during this epidemic, uh, much of that advice has gone to various different uh, subsets of the cabinet. I hope perhaps Chris Whitty will talk about that. And the other player in this cycle is how I drew this in the summer of 2020 is the cabinet office, which is part of our civil service. So back in the summer of 2020, I thought of this as a circle that went round and round and round. I'm going to talk a bit about a bit more about that in a moment. But let me just talk very briefly about the different kinds of people in this picture. People at the top in the cabinet are elected politicians and decision makers. The people in the cabinet office are almost all civil servants. Uh, SPIEM members are mostly uh, university based academics. And then there's this very strong secretariat uh, that Mark referred to who run the committee and write the, the, the consensus statements that bring together a consensus view based on the work that the academic groups have done. And SAGE is also a mixture mostly of university academics, some civil servants who run uh, the secretariat uh, and help produce advice to take to cabinet. So there's one final set of people here, and actually that's sort of people like me who used to be academics and are temporarily uh, civil servants. Uh, so I'm, Liam mentioned, I'm Chief Scientific Advisor uh, in the Ministry of Defence. That's a, that's a post that you do for a few years, having had a career as, as an infectious disease biologist. Uh, the two people who, who, who chair SAGE are, uh, are Patrick Balance, our Government Chief Scientific Advisor, and our Chief Medical Officer, Chris Whitty. So there's quite a sort of community there of different sorts of people. And one, I was quite pleased that somebody asked a question of, of Mark about actually what were the interactions. So it used to be like this, that, that basically from on high, we used to be given these so-called commissions from the cabinet office that were sometimes felt a bit crazy. You know, they would say things like, oh, do we have to lock up children's playgrounds? Uh, and uh, we would say, well, you know what, we don't really know. Um, and if you could click on a bit, uh, in the process of the, next, the, the sort of past few years of working together, uh, the sorts of interactions that we've had with Cabinet Office have, have, have become much more, well, first of all, much more frequent. We, we talk to them pretty much on a daily basis now. Uh, and I, I'm delighted to say, uh, as part of uh, those interactions, uh, we 
a, we managed to agree that a, a, that a, a scientist from the London School uh, could be based in the Cabinet Office part, part time for, for six months. That was Nick Davies. So we actually had an academic embed in there, uh, which has been, from our point of view, an absolutely outstanding success. Uh, you could probably take Nick for a drink and ask him what it was like for him. But I think one of the ways that things evolved well is this much tighter, closer working relationship between people who are doing modelling uh, and people who are, are civil servants really preparing information as civil servants for the Cabinet Office. Thank you. I finished with the slides now. I just, that was the only one I wanted to show. I wanted to very briefly talk through my view of what the phases were of this, of this pandemic, address a little bit about uh, making policy advice at the pace of relevance, so sort of making science advice for policy, I should say, at the pace of relevance, and then give some examples of uh, the kinds of things that I think uh, have been useful coming out of the modelling. So for me, the last two years have had really the following four phases. The first I would call the blind phase. So that was in February and March 2020, when we hardly had any data. And there was just this frightening thing going on and we didn't know what was happening. Uh, the second phase, I, I think it was the breathless phase. So that was the stage which we had hardly any immunity. I think of that as the rest of 2020. So as we went into lockdown, came out of lockdown, the data stream started to get better organized. It became possible to do more sophisticated analyses. Um, but I think sometimes a lot of us felt like the, the world was divided in two sets of people, really. There was one set of people who understood that there was this just enormous population of people with no immunity and another set of people who thought basically by June 2020 it was all over. Uh, and that's why I think of that as the breathless phase, because uh, most, of, most scientists knew how much there was still to come. And we were giving science advice into a, a policy format that, that didn't necessarily know that. Um, Mark did a very nice job of showing you some of the work that was done for uh, the phase that I think of as running from January to July in 2020. So we went into a heavy lockdown in this country in January 2021. And there was a phase really from January to July uh, where there was a, a, a carefully managed unlocking of that lockdown. And mathematical modelling, I believe, played a strong and important role in providing science advice to help manage that unlocking. And actually, I think of that as managed because although it was an unbelievable amount of work for people like Mark and his colleagues and equivalent teams in the London School and at Warwick, uh, it, was, it was paced in the sense that we knew what we had to do and when. Uh, for me, at least, that made it easier because I, I, I knew what was happening. I knew when the searches would be. And then from August till now, the, I, call the phase, I call it the high plateaus. We've been sat at this, this very high prevalence in this country, um, but, but not with the very frightening peaks we had had uh, up until January 2021. So turning to talk a bit about the, the, the pace at which work had to be produced, um, I, I, I want to focus on the four unlocking steps of the roadmap. So we knew when those would be, and we knew we couldn't really do modelling far in advance because we had to have up-to-date data uh, in order to try and understand what would happen at each step of unlocking. So what we did was um, two weeks before the decision was going to be made, uh, the modelers did a, a dry run so that we could check everything was working. And then a week before, well, in the week running up to the making of the policy decision, uh, we went through this, this system where uh, the modelers did the modeling. We had a spy in to discuss the modeling. Overnight, a consensus document was written by uh, the fantastic secretariat of SPYMO, which went to SAGE the next day, and then it went to Cabinet. And it was a huge concerted shared effort, um, which, uh, well, I, I, I am incredibly proud of the work that um, academics and civil servants did together for that. So that's one of the sorts, we've, we've had nice examples from, from Mark and also from Sam of, of the kind of advice that can come from this sort of dynamical modeling. I think there's also a different kind of insight, uh, which is what I would say uh, the, 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 the counterintuitive findings, 
And perhaps one of the most obvious ones of those is the consequences of fast exponential growth. I think everybody in this audience would under, uh, understands that completely, but there are people making policy decisions who, who do not have an intuitive understanding of what it's like to be trying to control a system which is doubling with a which is doubling more frequently than once every week. I think that's perhaps the strongest thing. But there were other examples too. I can remember having long conversations actually with um, science journalists uh, about uh, who were genuinely perplexed. Uh, it must have been in about December, January of last year. So, so December 2020, January 21. They were genuinely perplexed that whilst there were vaccines and that they come much faster than we hoped and they were very good, that actually this story wasn't over. And that was an insight that came first out of the modelling. I have a, longer, uh, a long list of these. I think um, another one I would add would be that uh, a summer 2021 wave uh, was a real possibility, uh, despite the fact that uh, normally with respiratory infections, we don't see summer waves. And there are others we can go into later. And I think none of these are accessible uh, through common sense alone. So to sum up, I think mathematical modeling of COVID epidemiology has been a very important component of science advice and policy making throughout the two years of the COVID pandemic in our country. It's been used at the highest levels of government for all the important decisions that have had to be made. And I think there are these two kinds of insight, the, the, very, uh, the very quantitative ones that, that Mark and Sam talked about in the earlier session, and also the qualitative counterintuitive ones. Um, each of these only becomes clear with the kind of careful, quantitative and consistent assimilation of very diverse kinds of evidence. And that can only be done in the framework of a mathematical model. Thank you. Angela, thank you for that. It was fantastic. I mean, real um, insight into what all this work and data and methods are for, in fact. Um, really is at the sharp end there. And uh, thank you for that. Fantastic insights. Um, I love in the diagram that everyone was a completely um, just a stick insect really as thin as anything, apart from people in the cabinet who were less thin, shall we say, in your diagram. But uh, that was absolutely fantastic talk. Uh, I am going to, there was obviously time for comments and questions later, but for now I will hand over to Sinead to introduce the next speaker, I believe. Uh, it's, it's truly a pleasure and a great honour to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Sir Jeremy Farrar, Director of the Wellcome Trust, who's made an outstanding contribution globally to uh, approaches to address the coronavirus pandemic and to inform policy. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, um, Sinead. Um, I'm afraid I don't have any slides, stick insect or not, um, but I did love Angela's slides. And, and Liam, I can't tell you how many hours I've spent making sure I got the backdrop to this. So <laughs> um, I wish I'd, I'd just kept the one you'd kept. Um, I, I, I hadn't spoken to Angela before this, uh, but it, like her, I enjoyed the talks earlier. Um, and I hope what I'm going to say is actually interestingly complimentary, I think, I hope to what uh, Angela said and, and maybe what Chris will, will come back to um, uh, in a minute. But to, to broaden it out um, and to sort of give a, a personal perspective from somebody that is certainly not a mathematical modeler, um, not an epidemiologist either, actually, just a, a, a clinician, clinician scientist. Um, and like the others, sort of frame it in three uh, sections. And the, and the title I think I gave uh, was uh, Before, uh, During and Transition Out Of. And, and I think the, the, perhaps one of the points I'm going to make is, is you think it's hard going into a pandemic. You think it's hard uh, during the pandemic. And it certainly has been in so many ways to so many people. Uh, but transitioning out of it's also very difficult. Uh, uncertainty doesn't suddenly disappear. Um, uh, people are fed up, uh, people are tired, uh, people's resilience is at its lowest point. Uh, there's a desperate desire amongst all of us, including politicians, to move on uh, and put it behind us. Uh, and yet actually we still are just two years into a novel infection and there remains actually great uncertainty about what that's going to mean. So just breaking that up in, into sections uh, in the before um, and many on this call have been involved in these. Uh, but but SARS-CoV-2 COVID did not come out of the blue. 
uh, my own work in, in emerging infections goes back really to 1999 in an outbreak very few would remember now, but of something called Nipah virus in 1999 in, in Malaysia, uh, which had many of the hallmarks actually of emerging infections that have come to trouble the last 20 odd, odd years. Uh, ecological change, uh, environment change, land use change, change of relationships between humans and animals, but also social and cultural tensions uh, in the context of Malaysia, tensions between pig farmers, which uh, was played an important role in Nipah, uh, but also between tensions culturally between Chinese ethnic groups in Malaysia and uh, predominant Muslim countries. So all sorts of tensions played out, which made it more than just a health issue. It was an economic, it was a social, it was a disruptive influence, had impacts on trade and travel and had geopolitical uh, ramifications. And I, and I think that in essence is the era we, we're in, which others have called the pandemic era. And I, I think this pandemic era, uh, the drivers of which I've mentioned, they were true in Nipah, they've been true in SARS and SARS-1 and SARS-2, MERS, Zika, uh, Ebola. Uh, and that is the changing ecology, changing human animal interfaces, uh, changing land use, climate change, and critically urbanization as an amplifying agent when an emergent uh, issue happens. And those issues are not gonna go away. Uh, whatever changes in society are likely to happen in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it is likely that those drivers are gonna continue. And therefore I think we do have to assume uh, that this won't be the last epidemic or pandemic uh, and that the ones in the future are likely to be more complex, more frequent, uh, and will affect a broader sector of society as we've seen in COVID than just a health issue. And that is perhaps one of the most uh, underlying features of COVID, that it has been much more than just a health issue. Uh, the other, in terms of before, is that warnings must be taken seriously, uh, and that the last event won't have an influence on the next event. Um, and so if you think you underreacted to one, or, or perhaps put it another way, if you think you overreacted to one, let's say the world made a decision, I didn't agree with it, but world sort of came to a narrative that the world overreacted in 2009 to the pandemic of influenza. Uh, I think that led to a direct underreaction in 2014 to Ebola. Uh, and what it means is you carry forward that memory and that, that context. And I think it's really important to appreciate uh, one epidemic doesn't influence another. And as we, uh, as COVID-19 continues into certainly the weeks and months ahead, if not years, um, uh, we are at risk, of course, of uh, another event. The other thing I'd say on the before, and Angela sort of talked about this as well, and I, I think this is absolutely critical, uh, trying to establish systems, functions, relationships, uh, science, uh, interactions, whatever you may wish to establish, uh, in a crisis is impossible, particularly a fast moving crisis. So you are very reliant on what you have in place prior to a crisis and your ability to build on that in a crisis. Because if you're trying to establish something de novo for the first time, including personal relations, institutional uh, structures uh, and other systems, and, and critically, of course, long term investment in science, you'll always be too late. If you're trying to suddenly increase your health capacity within your health system or learn how to respond in uh, in a scientific way within a political discourse, if you're trying to establish that in a crisis, you will always be too late. And I think uh, if you look at the UK over the last uh, two years, some of the things that it's done extraordinarily well, uh, like the mathematical modelling, I would argue, uh, like the interaction actually of scientific advice into government, which didn't start with SAGE in 2020, but has a long history, as Angela said, back to John Beddington. And whilst many have been critical of that, and we've all suffered from that to some degree, I would argue that actually it has been an absolutely essential bedrock and have argued with many other countries that actually the idea of scientific advice in all ministries as a permanent feature, not just in a crisis, and brought together under something akin to a chief scientist and chief medical officer is absolutely essential. And whilst we've been incredibly fortunate, I would argue, to have the particular individuals in those uh, places during the last two years, this cannot rely on personalities. It cannot rely on luck that you might just happen to have the right person in the right place. You've got to have these structures in place beforehand. If you look at the benefits of recovery trial or the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine trial, or indeed the modeling, as I've mentioned, those are all based on structures and systems and capacity that was in place long before the pandemic and was able to be leveraged uh, in response to it. The sequencing capacity at Sanger, uh, the public health structures. Now, nobody would argue that all of that was got right. 
Uh, but what I would argue is try and establish those without that bedrock of many years of investment in that sort of activity. NIHR, uh, the clinical networks that led to recovery, uh, ISARIC and uh, the role that the leaders of that played in setting up recovery, absolutely critical to our response, uh, ability to respond. And that means long term investments. Uh, during the crisis, the scientific advice, I think, is critical. Uh, and again, I think, uh, again, very heavily criticised at times, and we all bear some of the scars of that. But I think that scientific advice into government has to be embedded all the time. It has to be broad minded and diverse. It has to be open to other ideas. And it can't just be about my, my uh, biomedical or life science advice. It has to include advice on social sciences, behavior. It has to include economic and other advice. And it, its diversity is its strength and then having it pulled together and making sure uh, that it's the, 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 the cultural rules of that advice, the language, the understanding of what exponential means, whether in financial or in biomedical circumstances, is at least part of common debate and discussion. And then on top of that, those structures and systems are tested regularly, uh, not tested in a tick box exercise of some sort of risk assessment for an audit committee, but actually really tested tested uh, so that we know that they can work in a crisis and we know people uh, independent of personalities and individuals can function in that sort of crisis. I think ultimately you are uh, describing there uh, something very close to the UK system uh, and we should be very grateful for that being in place. The third area I talk about and this is now looking sort of if you like to the transition out and I think one of the lessons we've also got to work out how to do better at is how we better integrate uh, areas that I think have become too fragmented over the last decades or so, and that is public health, clinical medicine, academic research, industrial research indeed, uh, and, re and, and scientific generally. I think we've, we've separated these two out, and there are not enough people who have an appreciation of the strengths and weaknesses of all of those activities and are able to bridge the gaps and the fragmentation in those structures. I would love to see a way in the future of us bringing these together so that there is more interplay between those working in our public health systems, those working in uh, frontline hospitals and GP practices, social care, and the research community. We've done remarkably to drag that together in COVID over the last two years. We could learn the lessons of how we better integrate that in the future. And I think the only way of integrating it and sustaining it is to ensure that that all brings utility all of the time. Although my own background is in emerging infections, I would be the first to argue that you shouldn't base these structures on epidemics. You should base them on utility all the time, because I believe that's the only way to sustain this over the long term and make sure that those structures are in place when you need them. That means as rethinking careers, it means rethinking incentives, it means rethinking how we have people that have a culture and a language understanding of those different tribes within an overall ecosystem. And then the final thing I'll say is going to touch on geopolitics. And I think one of the other observations I would have the last two years is how we have struggled in every country to deal with an issue which is both troubling and horrible within a national setting, but also has major international ramifications. This isn't about aid. It's not about charity. It's not about doing things that are happening to far off people that we don't know. It's happening to us at the same time. And I think all governments have struggled with their domestic tensions and their international responsibilities. Uh, this is not a moral or an ethical argument. I think it's a scientific public health uh, and it's the right thing to do. And I think we've struggled with that. And I think the end result of that has been the, uh, the, the issues of vaccine inequity, where it may well be the right thing to do to share vaccines, but inevitably the political tensions uh, and the geopolitics of the time have meant that we've not contributed to the global vaccine equity issue as well as we could have done. And all governments have been had to focus on the domestic concerns. I think we need to rethink that and how we're going to deal with issues in the 21st century, which by their nature are going to be both domestic and international at the same time and often with the same degree of, of impact. And I don't think we necessarily have the political structures at a domestic level or the international agencies that can bring that together in one place at the speed that it needs to happen and, and, and make the case for equitable distribution of the tools that are needed in order to bring the pandemic over for all of us. So with that, I'm going to finish. I hope that was much more than 10 minutes. Um, and uh, uh, Sinead, thanks very much for the invitation. And um, Liam, it's great to see you. Um, thanks very much for asking me to join. Wow, that was a phenomenal talk. <laughs>
you truly did cover before, during and transitions from the pandemic. And I'm sure I'm not alone in having lots of questions to ask. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Liam now. Thanks. Uh, thanks, you know, uh, thanks very much, Jeremy. And uh, all I'm doing is uh, introducing uh, Chris Whitty, which will be quite short. Um, if you don't know who he is, then where, where have you been? Uh, Chris, uh, Chief Medical Officer for England, and with a, a very long, I'm delighted to say, um, very close association with London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, Chris, over to you. Thanks very much. And uh, many of the points I would have made have already been made and I'm not going to repeat them. The excellent uh, talks you just heard and indeed uh, earlier. Um, there were a few points though I thought I'd just like to bring out and I'm bringing them out as someone who sits um, as Angela has uh, sort of laid out at the interface between the technical people and the uh, policy people. And it, uh, you know, much of my framework for this actually would go back quite a long way to the first scientist, uh, scientist politician in England, at least, Francis Bacon. Uh, and he described one of the biggest barriers to uh, use to people thinking things through properly, which is what he called the idols of the cave. And this is the fact that each intellectual group really understands and probably over believes in its own intellectual framework and distrusts all other intellectual frameworks. And that's a, a risk for people who use models but don't produce them, and indeed for people who produce them. Um, when we deal with people who are actually using models in emergencies, um, they are generally wanting to make decisions, but they're also wanting to understand. And uh, the way in which the models that we had in COVID and indeed in previous um, emergencies I've been, in, uh, I've been involved in, uh, were interpreted uh, very often bore uh, only passing resemblance to the way that the people who produced them intended them to be interpreted. And uh, that wasn't the fault of anyone, but that was a reality. And my, uh, my observation over all of these uh, times when I've seen models being used is that people who use them either overtrust them and essentially assume that they are some kind of soothsaying which will predict the future or completely distrust them and won't use them at all. Whereas everybody who's involved in actually producing them is aware of the fact they're somewhere between the two. They're a useful tool amongst others for explaining what's going on and for some degree of forward look. Uh, but they also have very significant limitations. And I'm making a point that's obvious to everyone here, but not, uh, in fact, to the general public. Now, within that, uh, I, I think models are used for three different things uh, by policymakers and uh, indeed by the public. The first and arguably one of the most important is to explain. And if you think about what's happened in COVID, uh, same was true in the Ebola, um, the big Ebola uh, outbreaks uh, and epidemics in West Africa, um, for example, uh, being able to explain something using models is incredibly powerful, just letting people understand how things work. The second is to challenge. And this is, goes back to a point uh, Angela made, even quite simple things uh, like exponential growth are not intuitive to most people. They're not even intuitive, I've discovered, to most economists uh, who are involved in policy, which is surprising because uh, exponential growth is a key, key part of uh, economic thinking. Uh, so models used to challenge uh, existing beliefs are very powerful. Where I think that they, get in, they run into the biggest difficulties is when models are used to predict whether or not the people producing the models were intending to use them in that way. And in that situation, they have a tendency to uh, have the disadvantage of all iterative uh, models, which is inevitably they're going to uh, be at some distance away in, in fact from what uh, actually happens in reality. And then people look back on them and say, well, this model was wrong and misleading. And that's a misunderstanding of the model. But that is a repeated thing that happens over multiple um, emergencies. Now, if you think about some of the uh, major um, emergencies that have been recently, I'll take just the two. The, uh, firstly, the uh, West Africa Ebola outbreak. For that, um, models were absolutely essential. Uh, and they led to a, the, they were really the first thing that demonstrated to the outside world what was going to happen in terms of the scale of the problem so that very small numbers 
which we had at the point that this is being seen in, uh, in, in around the world, we're going to turn into very large numbers extremely rapidly. And without modeling, that would not have been realized until far too late, basically until it had happened. So the models were the thing which mobilized the world to help the countries involved to bring in resources uh, and so on. So, that, so just in that single way, they were massively powerful, but they were also very powerful in explaining the speed of what things were gonna go uh, to, uh, and also to track uh, the course of the epidemics, uh, the various epidemics in real time, and be able to predict a relatively short period ahead uh, where things were going. So uh, models were absolutely essential uh, in that everything, although, you know, to be clear, very many other sciences were equally important, including, as importantly, the behavioral sciences. If we think about COVID, uh, they've also been used globally, and we've heard uh, examples today just now from India and from the UK, but they've been used in multiple countries. Uh, again, to predict early on the scale that we might be facing, not in absolute numbers, but in kind of uh, size of problem we were facing, the shape of the upswing, uh, particularly in the early phases when we're dealing, uh, as Angela was saying, with an almost entirely uh, immune naive population. Some idea about the speed and how that was changing when it was getting faster and when it was getting slower, really essential. And uh, just introducing people to the concept of R, really obvious to everyone on this call, was again transformational in terms of public understanding of uh, what was needed and how we need, how we as society need to respond. Uh, and then um, to some degree, uh, predicting a potential size of the peak. But as I say, that is quite uh, quite um, uh, open to difficulties because what, of course what you never to be end up with is something very different. Uh, and I think in some cases, some of those explaining models were not as good as they might have been. We're all being self-critical uh, at explaining that these were the maximum theoretical size of peaks, but that those are very seldom reached actually in uh, reality because people take countermeasures uh, among other things. And they were also important in day-to-day -day planning of things like hospital uh, admissions. So uh, they were very powerful and they've been very powerful in many other emergencies that I've seen. Where, it, where, are, the, where are the weaknesses? And I think that there are probably several that we need to um, reflect on. The first of which is in public communication. And I think that uh, all of us were trying to communicate the outputs of models. I think in some cases, the uh, communication lacked a certain amount of self-doubt and that would have been helpful because what people heard was certainty and therefore they read it as a prediction when in fact what they should have been hearing is this is one scenario out of many or indeed this isn't a scenario at all. Secondly, uh, modelers and other scientists are all mutually unaware of the subtleties of one another's uh, areas and people from a modeling background very often explained other sciences uh, inaccurately just as some people from other backgrounds explain some of the models inaccurately and I think getting trapped into talking about areas out, out with our area, own area of expertise has to be handled with extreme care it doesn't mean it shouldn't happen but I think that also led to some degree of distrust of, of some of the information that was being given and I think we need to be again uh, quite careful of that next time we face uh, this problem. I think that we were also, um, uh, as, uh, as Jeremy said, uh, we were, um, to some extent, people looked back at what had happened uh, in the uh, H1N1 uh, 2009 flu pandemic, where I think wrongly the models were seen as being relatively inaccurate, I think wrongly, and prior to that, uh, what happened with BAC, uh, new variant CJD, and it did HIV, where I think some of the models were more accurate than others. Let's put it uh, that way. So there is a bit of a, a bit of history in the policy mind that we always need to be aware of. There are a couple of, uh, of areas where, in my experience, models are much less useful than the people who produce them think they are. And the first of them is in tail end of epidemics, and particularly in elimination eradication uh, attempts, where the great majority of models I've come across have not just been wrong, but wrong by a very, very large degree. And I think we need to be aware that that's an area of modeling that is still not really fully uh, at, at its full maturity, in my view. Uh, uh, and the second uh, is that integrating social behaviors into models is extremely difficult. 
because people respond to what they see around them and they self-correct. And we've seen this all the way through COVID and we've seen it in Ebola and indeed we've seen it through multiple other epidemics. And modeling social behavior uh, is extremely difficult. The third thing is that there, is an, there are multiple steps between a model uh, output uh, and a policy uh, output. Uh, and it's very dangerous if we, on the science side, start uh, being tempted by journalists or others into giving our policy solutions, when very often there are multiple other competing factors that we need to take into account. My final comment would just be an observation from within government. Certainly in the UK government, there are a very large number of highly numerate people in senior policy roles, and indeed some senior political roles, virtually all of them come from an economic background. And the way economists frame models and the way people from a, a biomedical science uh, background frame models are very different. And uh, there is a certain amount uh, in, in my experience of the fact that people think they understand the other person's models because they have a modeling uh, experience of models themselves and don't realize that people have come from an extremely different intellectual tradition. And so actually this can be a hindrance rather than a help. People actually think they understand better than they do uh, what they're being uh, dealt with. So uh, counterintuitively, some of the economists were some of the, the most liable to misuse because they thought they understood something they didn't, a model that was produced uh, from an epistemological point of view. And I'm sure the same would be true uh, the other way around. So I think we need to be aware of the fact that models come from very different disciplines. Finally, just to go on to the point um, that uh, both Jeremy and Angela have made about the, in, the scientific structures in the UK. I've been involved in the SAGES for virtually every emergency in the UK over the last 10 years for a variety of reasons in different areas, bar two. Uh, and modeling was really only central uh, in terms of biomedical modeling was only really central to two of them. Uh, but was central in other ways, for example, models by volcanologists, models by meteorologists, uh, in almost all of them. So modelling, uh, from, from an emergency point of view, uh, is used, and it's not just the kind of models that people on this call use, but models from many other disciplines are used in emergencies, uh, and they're incredibly powerful, but the general points I've made about having to communicate them and the fact that people either over-trust them or under-trust them, uh, I, I think are probably general to virtually every emergency I've seen. I'll leave the rest for questions. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. I'm trying to get my video to work, but that was fantastic as ever. And, and really, uh, really interestingly, uh, played into quite a few of the comments that are coming in on the questions and things, as well as uh, being great talking itself. I'm going to hand over to Sinead, and I think what we'll get, and Sinead, are you going to explain? I think we're going to try and go through as many questions and comments as we can, and we'll sort of take those in turn, and we might paraphrase a few, so apologies for that, but we'll uh, give it a go. Excellent. Thank you all for fantastic talks. Uh, lots of really good questions in the chat. Thanks, everybody, for contributing. I, I guess a theme that's come through quite a few of the questions in the chat is around translating and communicating science, uh, including trans uh, communicating complicated modeling in a way that the public and policymakers uh, and those communicating science, including journalists, uh, understand. And, and, and what I'd be really interested in hearing uh, from all of the panelists, and everybody has really touched on this theme about communicating science throughout their talks, which is fantastic. But what I'd love to hear is an example from each of you of where you think that this has been done really well as a kind of a, 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 an, an inspiration for, for others in terms of how we could do this better. Because you've all flagged it as an area where we could do better, but I'd like to hear some examples where you think, actually, I think that was, that was really good. Who would like to go first? Chris, I think you look enthusiastic, is that right? I always look enthusiastic. Uh, but Excellent. I think that the, um, I think on this one, I go back to the example I gave, I gave because I think it was um, the, there are two things which were explained early on, one of which I think was explained really well, and one of which I think was explained uh, much less well. Um, the, the first, the one that was explained really well was, was the concept of R. And actually, 
it, it was explained as a very simple concept. Actually, anyone's involved in modeling knows it is extremely difficult uh, in reality and how it plays through and how you, uh, how you calculate it and so on are, are very, uh, are very um, difficult. But that single concept helped a lot of the general public to understand what was being, uh, being attempted and what needed to be achieved. And it also helped the uh, policymakers. So I would say that, uh, and that was explained by lots of different people in different ways, but they were all explaining it incredibly well. I think what was less uh, well explained, because it is e even more difficult, was how uh, immunity plays into this. Uh, and even now, the way in which people understand population immunity and how that plays through to what is now being called an endemic state, which is, again, a very, very slippery concept. Two years in, there is still a lot of lack of understanding of these concepts. So I think if you take those two examples, I think it's worth examining, I'm not suggesting we do it now, but I think it's worth examining why is it on the first one, people grasped it remarkably quickly, despite it being quite a difficult concept, and on the second, we're still having trouble. And I think a lot of the problems with the second were laid out right down at the beginning, where mm. people came out with some, uh, some explanations that were overly simplistic, and therefore led to people becoming confused and they've stayed confused ever since. So I think, I think that's probably, those would be my two examples from both ends of the spectrum. Fantastic, wonderful answer. Uh, Jeremy, you look like you're moving forward to give an answer. No, like Chris, that was just my normal bodily movements. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but, yeah, I agree with Chris. I, I would actually be much more positive about the communication stuff. I, I mean, Words and, and, and things that we talk about now in common parlance with family, with friends, outside, totally in totally different walks of life that are now common part of language. Ah, oh, Chris mentioned, totally agree. Uh, to I, I think the level of understanding and appreciation of many of the issues, central and peripheral, has been absolutely extraordinary over the last two years. And there's many on this call, and I, I won't call them that because I'll forget people, but have played a role in that, including in social media. It gets... It gets criticised heavily, but actually there's some, been some brilliant communications. I'm going to pull out Adam, actually, because I think some of his threads, although I struggle to get to the end of them, is, are brilliant. Um, and they have really helped explain. So I, 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 I would be much more upbeat. The one, and this will be controversial, the one that I think has really been problematic is trust. Communication and trust and the sense of, of mistrust, uh, including in, yes, amongst us as scientists, but also, of course, amongst politicians, and it's not limited to this country. And I, I think trust is built up over a long time and can be destroyed very, very quickly. And uh, once you destroy trust, it's difficult to get back. And trust, communication is part of trust, and it has to be authentic, it has to be believed, it has to be real, and it cannot be a veneer. And I think uh, trust uh, has been critical, and it's uh, time's been eroded and very difficult to get back. Fantastic. Thank you. Ramar. Yes, so um, I feel that uh, communication has been a key part of this. And as statisticians, uh, you are often used to work behind the scenes, right? Not, uh, not really comfortable being in the public eye. So that was really hard for me, for particularly with television interviews. And I um, later on, I actually got much more com comfortable uh, in terms of um, talking about models and complex ideas. One thing I'd point out that this distinction between reported cases and underlying infection was very, very complex for uh, the Indian uh, audience, I think, that particularly. But this was really, really resolved by... Uh, looking at seroprevalence studies. So when the seroprevalence studies, India did four serial seroprevalence studies and those prevalence estimates came out about how many people actually had antibodies prior to vaccination, that was clarified. So concrete data can really give you an idea about the reported cases and what is the magnitude of underreporting if you do such studies. So I think that is something India did very well and was a fantastic contribution to clarify. Mm -hmm. I knew I was going to do that at least once. Uh, thank you, Brahma. Fantastic uh, answer. Uh, Angela. So I want to go back to uh, the people I'd like to call out are the science journalists. I remember one morning, uh, I did, uh, read it, I was probably on the BBC website, 
and there was a description of affinity maturation. And basically the, the question was, how come more vaccines makes it better? And, uh, and it was probably, to, I, I don't know who it was actually, but uh, somebody had written this just absolutely beautiful, very clear description of what affinity maturation is. And I have to, I almost choked on my coffee because oh, gosh, I never thought I would see that in, uh, in an, you know, an ordinary newspaper. And I think we should acknowledge that what lies behind that, I think there's several thing lies behind, things lie behind that. So number one, there's a huge amount of work that's been done by the scientific community, not just, not just modelers. I know modelers have done lots of it, but in many areas of science, talking to journalists so they get this stuff right. Number two, uh, a cadre of scientific journalists who want to get it right and will make the time to get it right. And I do think we should give a shout out to the Science Media Centre here in the UK that has done such a great job of bringing those two populations together. Fantastic. Excellent answers. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Liam, who's going to lead on the next question. Uh, thanks, Nate. Uh, there's a few questions on quite a good theme, which is, of course, um, we need the most fantastic methods and scientists to do all this stuff. But, but there's a big issue of data availability. And um, is it good enough? Is it high enough quality? Um, I think some of the examples given in the questions are um, questions around, do we really know how many people are dying from COVID at any one time? And I guess my question to the panel is around, do they think there were key gaps in our data, uh, either in terms of just availability or its quality at different times in the pandemic or in different geographies? And allied to that, what do we need to kind of build better or um, let's call it next time or the future or whatever? And Brahma, I might come to you because there's a couple of specific questions around India start with, but um, I welcome to everyone. Yes, thank you, Liam, for that question, because mm -hmm. as you saw that I put forward a wish list for data that I wish we had. Uh, mm -hmm. So in particular, I think that in, in India, and it was mentioned in the first session in developing countries, the reporting system and also connecting different platforms of data. So India has a fantastic vaccination database, a fantastic testing reporting database, but really to connect this with the sequencing data, with the um, clinical outcome data to give us real-time estimates of breakthrough infections. And if you, people want to compare different vaccines, what is going on in the population? And so these kinds of critical information is missing because of linkage, missing linkage of this data set. So often what you see is that some states and sub -nation national data are available, and that really distorts the information that we get because rural India is very underrepresented in the data sets. So uh, we continuously get information for certain pockets and that distorts the people who do not have voice remain unheard continuously. And that is bothersome in terms of how not representative this sample is. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is the death reporting system in India. And this has been, uh, you know, there are some recent papers in science which quantify the underreporting in terms of death, there was a question, what is the magnitude? The estimate is six to seven times of reported. So India is about to hit um, 500,000 reported deaths, but any estimate, if you do a meta-analysis of excess death estimates uh, that goes on from uh, 3 million to 5 million. So, and then what proportion of this excess death estimates are really attributable to COVID that takes us back to the issue of medical certification of deaths, which is already uh, quite poor in India. So really having this integrated public health data systems, which can cross talk and give us information in real time, which I think that we have seen wonderful examples in the world, but we really need those systems in place and particularly in terms of the civil registration system and medical certification of deaths. Thanks for that, Brahma. Chris, I don't know if you want to come in on the UK situation in particular, or, or global for that matter, in terms of do you think you've had the data we need and it's been good enough? Well, I think, I mean, there's nobody who ever uses data who isn't going to say it should be better than it is. Yeah. But the, there was a period right at the beginning where we really missed some absolutely critical data. Mm. Uh, and that was really around uh, what is a case and what is not. And that basically needed a test. Mm. 
and the lack of, of sufficient testing, not accurate testing, but the lack of sufficient testing really hampered our early response and our understanding of how the epidemic was going. And many of the problems that happened early on were basically because we didn't have sufficient testing. And that should have been wholly predictable because that also was the true in Ebola and it's also been true in virtually every other new thing. The ability to scale up testing is common to virtually every single major emergency which is on an infectious basis. Now, of course, I completely agree with the last answer. There are gaps in the data which are where the data is there and it's not properly linked. Uh, there are issues around mortality data and so on. Although, in fact, our understanding about the mortality rates of this were remarkably accurate remarkably quickly and that's thanks to uh, Ch uh, Chinese uh, scientist positions in the first instance then in uh, in Europe Italy and elsewhere as well as the UK uh, but this issue about not being able to tell a case was I think the single most important one had the disease been a slightly different one uh, the lack of data in many parts of the world particularly um, Africa uh, but also in many other areas would have been an, uh, even more of a disaster than it was at the moment. And I think the other thing which this highlights is if you want to be able to handle an emergency, you do have to have basic data and many countries do not. So building up data uh, capacity of some form is, is, is very important. If we have to try and start vaccinating, for example, in a systematic way, uh, uh, in many countries in Africa, we're starting from a very poor base, even of knowing where people are. So uh, census data, for example, uh, is really important for almost anything you try to deal with. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, Angela, Jeremy, I don't know if you want to come in on that one. Anything to add? Simply wave or start talking? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm jumping. You, you want to go next, Jeremy? So, um, of course, Chris is right. Asking modellers uh, if uh, the data's <laughs> they've got enough data is like asking farmers if the weather's been okay. Uh, they'll always say no. But I, I'd like to draw together the things that uh, three people have already said. So I think I think Brahma's point about having data wish lists is really important. Chris has already talked about uh, about other measures, about Chris talked about modelling in other emergencies, and, and Jeremy talked about being ready in advance. And I think these three things come together into. I mean, I never want to be blind like we were. We were so blind early on, and. You know, we have in this country, we have this thing called the National Risk Assessment. We have a list of the things that we think might go wrong. Um, and I think we should use models of those things that might go wrong to generate the data wish lists. Try and set up a model is a really great way to uh, make, a, make a wish list because you suddenly think, oh, I've got no idea what this parameter is. Uh, what, how am I going to get at it? And I think all that needs to be set up in advance. I think we just need to, we need to go through uh, the National Risk register and say right okay what data streams do we have to have running before this hits us and it's not just naming them uh, there's a vast vast amount of negotiation needs to go on about who is it who's got to give you permission to see them uh, and so on uh, and I think if, if, if for me that's the number one thing I learned from all of these last two years. Uh, Liam I, I as I will agree with everything that's just been said just another couple of points to add to it um Angela's point there and is pulling out what you have before um just keep stressing that's gotta as you think forward that's then gotta bring utility all the time because I promise you in three two five six years time assuming yeah. there's not another pandemic people's interest will wane and financial interest will wane political interest will wane so if we don't build this in and it's particularly true in low and middle income countries but it's true in every country if we don't bring build this into bringing utility to mm -hmm. policymakers clinicians governments all of the time through drug resistance or other infections tb whatever it is it'll wane over time so that would be my first plea the second plea is is that you, we were awfully blind chris and, and angelo just said about it um you have to deal with that uncertainty though <laughs> you can't say, well, come back in three months time and I'll give you an answer. Chris couldn't go into the cabinet office or Angela and say that. You have to be comfortable dealing with uncertainty. And then just to call out, yes, February, March, blind, as Angela said, we weren't blind in September, October. And yet we didn't use the data we had to make, I would argue, some of the better decisions. And surely that's got to be one of the big lessons when we had fantastic data in the autumn of 2020. Why didn't we use it? Uh, third point I'd make is this data has to be integrated. There's no point just having genomic surveillance. If the genomic surveillance isn't linked to epidemiology, clinical understanding, social stuff, et cetera, genomic surveillance on its own is a sexy thing to do, 
but it won't give you all the answers unless you link it up with epidemiology, public health, clinical and other features. And then the last thing to praise to the UK, in other countries that I've been working with, where there is a federal structure, moving stuff across that federated country, US being an example, Germany being another example, has been an absolute nightmare. And I think the UK deserves credit for the way it's taken a federal approach across nations and yet largely has worked together. Thanks for that. Chris, did you want to come in again? Yeah, I was just I agree with all the points made. I just wanted to add one thing to Angela's. I think we use sensitivity analysis far too little to determine which bits of the model we've really got to get the data right and which bits probably don't matter. The, the impression is given that all data is equally important. That isn't actually true in most models. And I think we should be much more systematic about that in, in a sense in the pre-emergency phase, because that helps tell us which bits are really important. Yeah. That's, great. That's a really great point. I think it's true of yeah, so much of the work I've been involved in as well. Sinead, I'll hand back to you. Sure. Uh, one of the things that came up in, in a number of the talks was about understanding different perspectives compared to your own and integrating those different perspectives together. And, and, and there's some of the comments in the chat that are focused on kind of training and education and should people get different should there be more training even at a school level or, or quite a junior level to so that we're better prepared going forward uh, and, and I guess this doesn't just apply to the UK but could apply internationally I'd be interested in people's thoughts I don't know if Bramar if you wanted to address that possibly so I do think that there are some lessons to be learned from models uh, we heard this morning that ensemble models were much better than each individual models. So I think this is true for synthesizing information from different sources and really listening. And I think that this culture of that I believe in my own models and there is a dogma and then there is nothing outside, I think has really hindered our progress. So I think if we take some lessons from uh, ensemble modeling to come to ensemble consensus in terms of listening to each other. And there are parts of the parameter space and the feature space, some models do better and some models do not do well. But if we all come together, this is almost symbolic that in terms of global coordination, it was mentioned many times that with amazing science, we are still struggling to end the pandemic because we cannot figure out how to distribute tests and treatments and vaccines in a globally equitable way. So if we learn from sort of the philosophy of modeling that many models were better in different parts and translate that to public health, that will be a good solution. And I think another challenge is really quantifying uncertainty that you have to be honest and not give over optimistic projections or uh, errors of accuracy beyond which you cannot really say. So to be humble and to be honest about uncertainty is also very important. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, do any of the other panelists want to come in on that? Uh, there's, there's, I, I, I would like to. There's some stuff in the in the questions about uh, bringing some of this kind of mathematics earlier in education, mm. and I'd be very pro that. I think that's a great idea. Personally, I would chuck out circle theorems. I mean, for God's sake, who needs circle theorems? Well, actually, I think a few chemists need circle theorems uh, from GCSE. So GCSE is what we do at 16 uh, maths and, and put in a bit of modelling so that people know what a model is and can treat it with its proper respect. And when I say proper respect, I mean, you know, both positive and negative. Uh, and I, I think Brahma made very good points about, about uncertainty. And uh, wouldn't it be great if our 16-year-olds had some sort of sense about how what they learned from their model was so conditioned on how good the data they had to put into it was. Sinead, I didn't realise we could throw things out. If Angela's going for that, then I'm yeah. going to say I would throw out quite a lot of <laughs> complex neuroanatomy and mainstream anatomy in medical school education, because Absolutely. I'm not sure I have ever used where my this vein or that vein inserted or that muscle. Inserted. I'm sure it is useful for some but I would much rather see better integration of use of data, how to use data, uh, et cetera, into medical school education than trying to remember where my muscles, um, uh, tendons went. Here, here. I think that would have been better use of my energy too. Uh, uh, Chris, I'm not sure if you have anything to add to that. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I've got uh, at least three lectures worth to add to that, but I'm just going to add <laughs> one point, uh, which is I think that the, uh, the group of sciences which are almost invariably central to the response and almost always thought of last are the qualitative social sciences. And I mm. think getting a proper respect for them amongst people who come from a quantitative background, and I'm one of the people who comes from a quant background, I think is really central because we, we usually wake up to the fact we wish we'd consulted them more about two months in. Fantastic, thank you. Liam, back to you. Yeah, I might follow that theme, Chris, because it picks up a few of the questions, which I, I guess uh, I'll try and summarise as, it, it's the extent to which our models of the, and our responses are really being driven by kind of hard, easily quantifiable science and the extent to which issues around you know, anthropology, the way people behave and projecting those and thinking about how they're influenced and the influence they're going to have on subsequent infection patterns. Uh, and have we under underused those sort of softer or uh, more social type sciences and overuse the more biological and more easily quantifiable, I guess is the question overall. Well, shall I have the first go with that? I don't think we yeah, under yeah. I don't think we over I don't think we overuse the uh, biological ones, but I definitely think we underuse uh, the qualitative and wider social sciences, uh, and we we miss opportunities to integrate them uh, many times over, um, not just in emergencies, actually, but it's particularly stark in emergencies. So I, I think we should get a lot more serious about how we bring them together. One of the things that makes this tricky is that relatively few institutions are equally strong in quantitative and qualitative methodology. And I think if we're going to do this, we've got to see this as not just interdisciplinary or whatever you use to choose to use, but actually it's going to have to be in, inter uh, institutional because uh, otherwise it's very unlikely we're going to be able to respond to these properly. Thanks for that. Andrew, do you want to come in on that one at all? Well, I was just going to say that. Um... Uh, again, we did. There were in place um, surveys about behaviour. So there's something called Comix that comes out of the London School uh, that we use a lot. Barely a week goes by that we don't look at Comix. And then, uh, and that was, in my view, that is social science that arose out of things we knew we had to know because of epidemiology. Then, of course, there are other things that other people use, like sort of all the Google Mobility data has been very, very important. I think the thing that the Google Mobility data points us towards is some of uh, the social science stuff we want to know is becoming uh, more metricated. And I think, I think the growth of that is an incredibly exciting area of science, actually, because mm. uh, so, so sometimes it's difficult. If you can't measure things, it's very difficult to know whether someone's hypothesis is right or not. That's the trouble, isn't that? Liam, what I, what I would say, which is a sort of extension of that, um, is that I, I don't know if colleague, ex-colleagues on SAGE would agree with this. I, I think we were also a bit slow, not just on the behavioural social sciences, but also um, at, at community uh, input into um, the thinking, um, particularly as, as there was, as we know, a very big influence of inequality, of... Uh, um, uh, different impacts in different communities. And I, I would uh, argue that we were a bit too slow, not just in the qualitative science, uh, qualitative sciences, social science, et cetera, but also community involvement in um, decision making. And, and I think that came a bit late. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Bremer, I don't think you wanted to come in on this, but feel free not to. <laughs> Yeah, just one comment. I think that just to, to focus on India is that, you know, in rural India, the techniques to address vaccine hesitancy is very different. And we see that in the United States as well, that messages have to be contextualized. And there is a whole science. And if we could all work in an integrative team and really have buy-in from community leaders, uh, religious leaders, community health workers, then the system will be much more bolstered. Yeah. Great point. Uh, thanks for that. Sinead, back to you. Sure. I'm going to put up, there's a question here from an anonymous attendee. Do you think that there's a potential in the future to work more closely with other nations? So I guess that's something we haven't touched so much on in the panel discussion. And what this person's asked about is modelling that can take into account travel limits, vaccination inequalities, etc. 
I mean, do you think we should be looking more uh, uh, across different geographical boundaries as opposed to our own? Who wants to head us up on that easy question? Ooh, silence. I was, wait I was waiting for Jeremy too, but <laughs> in the, in the ab absent Jeremy, I mean, pretty obviously we need to be trying to do as much as we can internationally. Uh, and we should be trying to learn from other countries and uh, sharing knowledge where we have it. That's not the same as saying we should try and integrate every single travel pattern, every single vaccination thing into models. My experience of those kind of models is they, they turn an already quite unstable model into an even more unstable model. And it's really, if, if, we, had, if we were honest about the constant tools, they'd be so wide that they'd be largely meaningless. So I think big difference between yes, make, uh, make the science international uh, and trying to make a grand universal model of everything, which I think is almost always doomed to fail. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Sinead, the other thing I'd add is, again, this doesn't get built in a crisis. Um, and we all know that there's no comment on the on the shift of DFID into FCDO. And uh, we're very fortunate with the chief scientist that's come across there, I think, of the London School as well. Um, uh, but, but we need this being built all of the time. And the, this science diplomacy and health diplomacy and sharing of information again, is not trying to establish and cobble together in a crisis, but is part of the work of the future of FCDO, uh, the future of the government, and that scientific diplomacy is a critical component of what the country needs and does all of the time outside epidemics. Fantastic, thank you. Any I just want... Oh, yeah, I just life. wanted I just want to say that, you know, I was always working through this whole time. I was always envious of the data systems in England or the Israel or Denmark, where they have very nice population based cohorts and integrated data. United States is not great for that either, because the electronic health record is very hard to merge and assemble. So uh, in the first days when the Delta variant properties were articulated, uh, it was all the key papers came out of UK, but the variant really originated in India uh, as far as we can trace back. And then there was lack of the paucity of sequencing data and connecting with clinical outcome really prevented us from doing more. So I wish that these models of integrated intellectual systems and data ecosystems will be actually available to all of the world. So if I could just briefly add, I mean, I think we've, we've, we have been recipients incredibly fortunately of advice uh, from overseas specifically about new variants. So um, today actually, uh, people from Denmark came to talk to SPYM uh, mm. about everything they know about the epidemiology of BA2 that's circulating there first. I think the whole world has to be incredibly grateful uh, to the South African epidemiologists who, who told us about Omicron. And actually, I think we do need to think a bit, I don't know, I, I, I think I slightly feel that, well, I don't want to get too political. I think we should, we should make, sh we should take every possible opportunity to tell South Africa how completely amazing and helpful they were, and that uh, we would do the same in, in, in reciprocation if it was in our country that a new variant arose, try, would try to be really, really open and public about it, even though we know what it might mean uh, to our citizens and who, who might want to travel. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Chris? Yeah, and just on that, I mean, one of the things that I think I'm really saddened by is that um, some commentators, largely for predetermined reasons, have taken the fact that we were all very much took the South African data of some of the best in the world, which it all really was, and South African scientists, some of the best in the world, which they are. And then ask the question is, does this apply to the UK, which was a genuine uncertainty for a whole variety of quite sensible reasons, and then said, well, this means you're disrespecting South African science, and then said to South Africans, the UK is disrespecting South African science. Absolutely not at all. The South African science has been outstanding all the way through. And we've, you know, they've, it's not just with Omicron. Previously, they've also contributed very heavily to this, as have many other countries. I'm just uh, following on from Angela's point. So I think we, we I, I completely echo her view. And some people have unfortunately made mischief of the fact that we've been trying legitimately to try and work out what is appropriate from one country to another and what is not, because it's always very difficult to translate across. Yeah, 
Yeah. Sinead, what, I, what, I would, what I would say on that, the South African, which I, I agree totally, again, it goes back to the investment in science in South Africa over many, many, many years that that was possible. That's the first thing. And the second thing, I, I, I do wonder if we have a sort of a, a Premier League or Major League Baseball for those in America um, and a secondary group whereas actually we could learn a lot from secondary groups who may not be our natural bedfellows in a way. You know, we often go to Denmark. That's great. Very similar country, the Netherlands, Germany, whatever. We could learn a lot sometimes from other countries who, um, who I think could have informed us as well early on. And we perhaps treated that with a bit of um, not the respect perhaps it was due. Thank you. Liam, back to you for the final uh, question, I would say. You started to answer my last question. So we're going to finish on time. So a brief question to all of you. Thinking about the future, uh, whether we're transitioning out of COVID or indeed there'll be recurrences, of course, or what about the next pandemics? What have we, I mean, from your own perspectives, I guess, over the last couple of years, what have we learned that we have to do better? What, what, what have you seen that you think, yep, we could definitely do that better and here's how? No pressure then. <laughs> I can start. Jeremy, do that'd be great. It's an appreciation that, that whether it's next year or in a few years' time, we are living in an era where this is likely to be more, more frequent and it'll be more disruptive to a broader sector of society, uh, um, more likely to travel, more likely to affect education or e economics. And therefore, as an insurance uh, system, we need, whether it's the basic science, whether it's modeling, whether it's uh, manufacturing access to vaccines around the world, we do have to have this capacity uh, ready. We cannot establish it in the dynamic of a, of a pandemic. Uh, and we have to ensure that that is integrated into issues of public health importance that brings utility all the time. Uh, those, that would be a, a easy, easy to say and difficult thing to do, but that would be my summary. Absolutely. Anyone want to go next on that one? Any key lessons you've learned could do better for the future? Angela, you're looking. Or Chris, yeah. I, I think that um, we've always known that when you have a new disease for which you don't have medical countermeasures, you have to use social uh, measures. We've never done anything on the scale that happened in COVID all around the world. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think we need to be pretty honest with ourselves about which bits of that actually worked and which bits didn't. And also, importantly, which ones are relevant to other forms of pandemic, because this happens to be a respiratory pandemic that particularly affects older people. You could have had a completely different pandemic for which the countermeasures we use this time around would have been irrelevant or uh, extraordinarily inefficient. Uh, and I, I think we need to kind of re, really re-examine how we use social measures whilst we're waiting for the medical cavalry to ride over the hill, because we were very fortunate uh, in this sense, I mean, you know, this time around, that it was a vaccine preventable disease. The last big, big pandemic, HIV wasn't, still isn't. Uh, and we were very lucky at the speed at which things were developed. Had it taken five years to get substantially effective counter medical countermeasures, uh, which it could easily have done, um, uh, we could be, you know, what would we be doing now? So I think that is one we really need to look at quite carefully. Grandma, anything from you? Yeah, I, I think that if we if we could ensure how to, we have done amazing science, but still global collaboration, we see so much inequity uh, across the world. If we could work together to reduce those gaps, uh, that would be something that um, I'd like to focus on. And I, I think that uh, like every statistician, statisticians like all artists fall in love with their models. Uh, in the beginning days, uh, I think we are too much in love with the model and thinking about each of these uh, NPI or PHIs and what crushing consequences it has on human life in terms of mental health, in terms of economics. And so to have an integrated viewpoint about that. And as we are like, you know, researching long COVID to recognize the impact on other domains, not just COVID transmission. It is very easy to lose sight of that. Uh, the loss of education for Indian children for two years of school closing. The, you know, the other immunization program, nutrition programs being disrupted. So to have a more holistic view of the whole thing as we are talking and respect different perspectives. Thank you for that. Uh, 
I'm going to close so we finish on time. You'll be delighted to hear I've got no time to say anything meaningful. So I want to say uh, thank you, obviously, to everyone coming and engaging. Thank you to the panelists. Um, we've learned so much uh, today. And I think for me, we, we, as you say, we, we, we're moving forward now. We've seen how important data and the really best methods we can bring to that data. We've seen how important that is in this pandemic. And it's going to be ever more important, I think, both as we continue with COVID as we begin to transition out with new pandemics, but particularly around that transition and what's happened around the world as we try and repair and rebuild, be that in the UK National Health Service and the massive backlog of problems, that's going to need enormous amounts of data science bringing to bear on it, or whether that's the impact of schools closing in Uganda for a whole two years and the massive impact that's going to have on society in the future. Just two examples of thousands of questions and problems that I think are going to need data and better use of data and data science in the future. So thanks again for coming. Thanks to the panelists. And I think on that I will close unless the organisers want to say anything in particular. But uh, I think it's been a great afternoon. I'm sorry I missed the first half uh, busy generating data, seeing patients. But thanks again uh, to all.